Greetings, everyone, um, and Happy New Year. Today is January 11th, uh, 2034. I'm sorry, 2024. <laughs> I'm getting way ahead of my It ain't that far of a new year, so. <laughs> Got some smudge on my glasses or something, but uh, um, well, welcome to, uh, this is both your regular session as well as your planning and zoning of your full uh, Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas Commission meeting. Before I'll call the meeting order, I want to announce that some commissioners, staff, and the public are attending remotely via Zoom by phone, and they also may be on site. All participants joining by phone should please mute your phones at this time. And when not speaking, uh, make sure that you speak at an audible level um, so that everyone that is within sight and sound um, will be able to hear you and um, can uh, we can get a clear record um, for uh, memorialization by our clerk. Um, this is critical given the number of remote participants and the current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General's office. I will now call this meeting to order. Clerk, roll call, please. Roll call. Townsend? Here. Burns? Here. Ramirez? Here. Hill? Here. Kane? Here. Lopez? Here. Stites? Here. Davis? Here. Bynum? Here. Burroughs? Here. Garner? Here. Thank you, Clerk. Tonight, we'll have our invocation by Sister Therese Banker of Our Lady of St. Rose Catholic Church, immediately followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll ask everyone to please stand. I live in a world full of words, emails, texts, phone conversations, and did I say emails? So I have found the invitation of this song a comfort, and I want to share this invitation. I invite you to lift your hearts. Be still and know that I am God. You are my chosen ones to whom I show my ways. Give me your cares and rest in me. Be still, be still and know that I am God. God, help us to find the moments to be still, walking to or from our car, walking down a hallway, driving to or from work. Help us to know that you are God and that you care about this community of Wyandotte. We ask for your spirit to assist this commission in their discussions and decisions during this meeting tonight. Please. Keep everyone in our community warm and safe during this frigid weather. And bless all those public work servants who cleared our streets and kept us safe this past week. And whatever is happening in the Red Sea, please, Lord, part the waters again and lead us to a world of peace. I pray in the name of Jesus who ask us to come and give to him our cares. Amen. Amen. And if I could, before you do the Pledge of Allegiance, a point of personal privilege, they say in the legislature, short. So Mayor Garner and Mr. Murray and I all attended the governor's State of the State last evening. And in concluding her State of the State, she called legislators to put aside old memories and differences and work together. And I quote her, I encourage you to remember the words of that great Kansan, Ted Lasso, who said, you know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? It's got a 10 second memory. So be a goldfish. And she concluded, we have a unique opportunity to build on the progress we've made and to truly make a lasting impact on the state we love and the people we serve. And I say all of you have that same challenge. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to and the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sister Charisse, and thank you for sharing the governor's words. Uh, 
I know they resonated with a lot of uh, elected officials and public servants throughout the state. Clark, are there any revisions to tonight's agenda? Yes, Mayor. An agenda update was issued, adding items number six and seven to the mayor's agenda. Those are the only revisions. Thank you. This takes us to the mayor's agenda. The first item uh, is a proclamation proclaiming December 14th, 2023 is Bob Brennanstein Day. Uh, Clerk, could you read that for us, please? I'm sorry, Bob, I've been corrected. Let me, I don't wanna, no disrespect. Bob Brennanstein, correction. Proclamation, whereas after an incredible 21 years of service, the fantastic Kansas City Metro community, Bob Brettenstein has decided to embark on a well-deserved retirement. And whereas Bob Brettenstein opened Brett Stein and Deli on November 15th, 2002. And since then, it has been a cherished destination for birthdays, anniversaries, high school reunions, pub crawls, the best St. Patrick's Day parties in town, happy hours, lunch breaks, first Fridays, Saturday football games, and so much more. And whereas Brett's also catalyzed the transformation of the adjacent neighborhood, drawing more incredible local businesses to the hill. And whereas Brett's famous Reuben sandwich has achieved legendary status, consistently hailed as the best in KC by food critics and casual foodies alike. And whereas Bob's family is so incredibly proud of him for not only realizing his dream to build a business like Brett's to support them, but for creating a gathering space that means so much to so many and for continuing to bring people to historic Strawberry Hill. Now, therefore, I, Tyrone Garner, Mayor CEO of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, do hereby proclaim December 14th, 2023 as Bob Brettenstein Day in Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, and encourage all citizens to recognize Bob Brettenstein Day. Thank you, Bob. You wanna to come to the podium, you and your family? I think anybody that's gone to Strawberry Hill, you, you cannot miss Brett's on the corner. And it's been a staple, um, not just in Strawberry Hill and Wyandotte County for years. And so um, this is an honor to give uh, this proclamation. Bobby, you, you got some words? <laughs> we ain't gonna let you get away. Okay. But, but thank you for the comment. Appreciate it. Thank you, God bless you. This takes them to items number two and three and their proclamations. Clerk, could you read the uh, summarized versions of those? Yes. Now, therefore, I, Tyrone Garner, Mayor CEO of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, do hereby proclaim Sunday, January 14th, 2024, as Justice Sunday Day in Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Proclamation. Now, therefore, I, Tyrone Garner, Mayor CEO of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, do hereby proclaim Saturday, January 20th, 2024, as Golden Royalties Chapter Day in Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you, Clerk. That takes us to our fourth item. Um, is a presentation from Dr. Macon Cook. She can come forward and staff um, regarding the Kansas City Public Schools Systems uh, Community-Wide Early Literacy Program. Um, also recognize Irene Cadillo as well as JD Rios and my uh, community uh, economic development community advisor, uh, Lavert Murray um, and Steve Williams um, for uh, facilitating um, this meeting that we had with them. And we really thought it'd be important to share not just with the commission and uh, staff, but also um, the community as well on some of the good programs that are out there. So um, please proceed, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us tonight. Uh, we're going to get our presentation up and going. All right. Do you just want me to tell you when to click? Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. So we are here tonight to talk to you a little bit about kindergarten readiness and KCK. Uh, tonight, we're going to share a little bit about our journey and our current projects that we're doing and some ways to partner. And then at the end, we'll save a little bit of time for questions. Okay, so I wanted to start us off with a timeline of some things that we've been doing. So um, 
Three years ago, we started a community-wide kindergarten transition team. Uh, community-wide means we started with uh, just the community in this within the school district. And then after we started that, we have um, attempted to kind of go all out to Turner, Piper, Bonner, other parts of Wyandotte County. We're still working to form those partnerships further outside of the school district, but it's something that we've started and we're interested in. But we started because we received a grant from the Kansas Health Foundation and then some other kindergarten readiness subgrants. And we wanted to come together as a community to see what we could do to prepare students for kindergarten. So our focus was that as well as early literacy. And from uh, those things, we decided to implement kindergarten readiness kits and read play learn spaces, which we'll talk about tonight. And then um, in, our, in our year three, which is now, we have started to attempt to see if what we're doing is making a difference through some surveys and some assessment data. So first off, I wanna talk a little bit about the team. Um, we are using a collective impact model to guide our work. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, our team uh, consists of a community-wide collaborative, which you can see on the screen is parents as teachers, the public library and KCK, El Centro, Educare, our school district, as, as well as other people. Um, our focus is these four things, ready child, ready family, ready schools, and ready community. So everything that we do together as a team, we make sure that it's meeting those four pillars. And then uh, we wanna talk a little bit about our goal. So our goal is to ensure that children, families, schools, and the community are kindergarten ready. And on this next slide, if you wanna just take a couple seconds, which I think it's in front of you as well, uh, to look at this quote, we really just want to point out that school readiness involves more than just the child. It's about children, but it's also about families, it's about environments, it's about schools and communities. And that children aren't innately ready for school, we have to help prepare them. And families are the key to do that. Good evening. I'm Erin Pitts. I'm the early literacy access specialist um, for KCK public schools, um, primarily with early childhood. And I'm going to share a little bit about how we're meeting our goals. And then afterward, um, Dr. Tucker is going to share um, more about what we're doing. So um, you can go to the next slide. So we have four small groups that meet on a regular basis bi-monthly, and one of these groups focuses on the kits that get sent home to families. We send out 1,500 kits, um, half of that school district preschool kiddos, and then the half, other half go out to child care centers and home daycares, library, churches, other places like that. And then another project we have is our read, play, learn spaces. And then the other two groups that meet, we won't focus on tonight. We'll just focus on the first two. And go to the next slide. So in the last couple of years, we had a guide developed by this small group along with parents, um, other community members. We had some feedback from other kindergarten transition groups as well. And this guide was developed to not only help families understand what it means to be kindergarten ready, because that term is, is used very differently across the whole nation, as we probably know. Um, so our guide was really developed to think about Wyandotte County and KCK as a whole. So we focused on the first side as being social emotional skills and development, physical development and health, because we know when children are healthy and physically healthy and they have those social emotional skills, then we can focus on academics like language and literacy and math and science. So this guide, we are complete with it. It's, it's ready for going out into um, the school district, into businesses and things like that. And we do have copies that we can have made for any organization that would like to have it in their space go to the next one. So I'll share a little bit about the kits, not too much tonight, but these kits we have, um, which anybody's welcome to look at, we brought one with us. They are shared at conferences and then at community daycares and in-home daycares, we give them straight to the site and they share those with families to actually take home. They don't need to turn it back in. They get to keep the kit. Thank you. 
So we have things um, every quarter that focus on early literacy skills, numeracy, um, things like magnetic, magnetic numbers, um, magnetic letters, anything that helps them develop those pre-reading skills. And you can go to the next slide. And these are some of the kiddos that are using the kits. And we also have had a lot of families who are sending us videos every day because they're so excited about, <laughs> about um, using the kits at home with their kids. We have one mom who's just like thrilled over the moon sending videos every day. And I told her, thank you so much. You don't have to do this, but we really love it. Um, but she's just really excited. And they're teaching their kids in their home language as well, which I think is really awesome. So, and then finally, just a little uh, bit about our child care partnerships. This is actually an in-home daycare that is using the kits. And then on the next slide, we've been partnering with child care centers and the school district to provide just a lot of like collaboration and cohesion in getting kids ready for kindergarten all together. And now Eva is going to share about our Read Play Learn spaces. Good evening. I'm happy to share about the Read Play Learn spaces because those are that's a project that's right in our community. And what these spaces are designed to do is to create safe, fun, and engaging environment for children and family. They are equipped with child size furniture, books, lots of them, and the children can take them home. They have literacy items like blocks and letters and storage cubes and learning materials and information that are there in these learning spaces for families such as happenings in the community and the county uh, about schooling information and health and wellness information. Currently, we have three we have had three ribbon cutting events and I will show you those spaces in just a minute. To ensure more of the read learn spaces are available, we are inviting business organizations to partner with us in planning and hosting a, a space. We do appreciate it. We do appreciate Mayor Gardner and some of the commissioners and community members for attending the grand openings when we had them. Uh, currently, the replay learn spaces have been funded by a partnership with Lakeshore Learning Scholastic and Laundry Care Foundation. These partners are providing, providing a continuous shipment of books for families to take home. Uh, also, we are in search of partners to help sustain and maintain these spaces throughout the year. Why are these spaces so critical? Because literacy is very important. It is vital to learn term, long term success. Replay learn spaces enhance children access, access to activities that support school readiness, such as talking, reading, writing, and playing. So let go on to the next slide. And I would like to share with you some of the places going from top to down, uh, to bottom. At the top on the left-hand side for me, you see all of the books. Our, our children can go inside, look at the books and take one home. Uh, at the bottom, that is uh, Rosedale Ultra Wash. We have a read, uh, play, learn space there. At the top, um, that's at the WIC building. We just opened that up. Uh, it was in October. And there's a space there for when folks come in for their appointments, the children can go over there and explore. At the bottom, uh, the two pictures there, the one on the left-hand side, we invite some of our authors in our community to come and read to the children. And on the other side at the bottom, that's Leah's laundromat. She has a replay learn space. At the very top, uh, that was another community person. That was a person from the Monarch baseball team who came to read to the students. And at the bottom, you have an opportunity to see some of the furniture that's there. If you go to the next slide, here's Leah's laundromat on the queue. Go there and see this space. Her claim to frame is that she also provides books for the young ones, but she also offers uh, young adults books too, because they wanted to read more too. 
The next one is Rosedale Ultra Wash, and uh, that's their space. And they're so excited that they had an artist to come in to draw, uh, the, uh, decorate the walls and add many different things. And then the last one is at the Wick building. And we just opened that. So what are we asking? We want you to be a part of this excitement. We need a place where we need to go to open up another replay learn space. Uh, because here are the areas where we have them. We would like to have these spaces across our county. We would like that very much so. So the last slide for me is this, who will be pictured in our next re replay learn space? That could be you. Oh. All right, so uh, just a couple of final slides. So uh, we're talking about planning for sustainability. Uh, right now, we are utilizing some remaining grant funds. We have enough funding to support one more Read, Play, Learn Center that we hope to um, do this spring. Um, after that, we're looking to state grant funds and church grant funds. We actually have, uh, for the past three years, received a very generous amount of money from the Church of the Resurrection, around $100,000, uh, some years a little bit more than that, to support our kindergarten readiness kits. So uh, we're very grateful for them, and we hope to continue that partnership. Um, the kits are very expensive because the kids get to keep everything that's in every kit at their house. So we want to be able to continue to do that. We're also looking now to reach out to local businesses who uh, want to be invested in early childhood and then some local uh, government partnerships as well. And then ways that we'd like to partner moving forward. Um, if, we, if there are networking opportunities, uh, groups of people that we can get in front of to share our message, we would love to do that. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer at any of our Read, Play, Learn events, we have ribbon cutting ceremonies where we invite the community to come and celebrate our new Read, Play, Learn Center. We usually get media coverage uh, so that people all over can see the great work that we're doing. Uh, we'd love for everyone to join our team and help us out. Um, we're always and forever going to be looking for funding so that we can keep this going and keep our great work alive and well. And then... We just really want to advocate for our early learners in our county and just spread the news that um, there's a lot that we can do when they're really young so that they're ready to go so that they can graduate from high school as they get older. Um, and one thing to point out that's on one of your handouts is that uh, they have learned through the Laundry Cares Foundation that places that families already go and visit are it's more likely for those families to engage in literacy and learning activities there than go somewhere like a library where they there may not be another reason why they're going so that's why it's so important for us to put these read play learn centers in places where families are already going because um and some of the pictures that we have we already we see kids in them all the time so uh we're really hoping that we can keep this going uh looking to barber shops um county jail, anywhere where families have to come and wait, or anywhere where children are that they might need something to do while their parents are doing something else. So we'd love to hear from anyone that wants to um, help out or learn more information. This is just a bridge showing that we are trying to bridge the gap between um, school and home. And so a way that we can do that is through the kits. And another way that we can bridge this is through our um, Read, Play, Learn centers. All right, and there's our contact information. So you're welcome to contact any of us with, uh, if you need more information, we'd love to hear from you. And if anyone has questions, I think we're... All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we do have a question, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, if you most don't know, I work in the education field. I work for a private school uh, who has students who have language-based language, uh, language based learning disabilities. So the majority of our student body has learning disabilities, but we like to call them learning differences. Mm -hmm. A lot of our students have dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, ADHD. And so this 
this type of program is very crucial for those certain type of populations of students, but not just for that certain type of population, but for all students. Um, kindergarten is a critical year for foundational, foundational mathematical concepts, phonetic, phonology, everything that a student needs to thrive, it, it comes from kindergarten. So anything and everything we can do to get our preschoolers ready for that critical year, I, I support and I would love to help in any way, shape or form. Um, I know I was invited to the Rosedale cup ribbon cutting, but unfortunately I couldn't get a sub to take my <laughs> to take my spot. So I wasn't able to attend the cup uh, ribbon cutting. But, um, and then I was telling Commissioner Davis is like, you guys were speaking my language, uh, giving the presentation, you know, education is something very important to me. I, um, I, I love my students. And so if I can do anything here to help the students in Wyandotte County and Kansas City, Kansas, I will do it. So if you Thank need you. my help on anything, please let me know. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all. This is a great presentation and very, very uh, exciting. Um, you all may or may not be aware, and I think we are working with USD 500 folks on the Raising WICO Committee, which is all about child care access in Wyandotte County. And so um, I think it would be great to maybe have you all present or at least have some sort of bridge or partnership because all of that is about child care access. I also think it would be great uh, um, for us to explore maybe an option here either at City Hall or in the health department because we do have spaces where parents are waiting whether it's for appointment appointments or what have you and so it would be a great first step in that partnership to have a read play learn space here uh, in in the UG uh, we tend to be in my opinion a little sterile when it comes to our decor and so we can use some color we can use um, some some other uh, uh, decor that is more family friendly and um, um, yeah, just kudos to you all on the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. And I believe you all are in the health department, aren't you? Yeah. Wick. Yeah, in yeah. the WIC building. So, and so some of you might ask, well, Mayor, why did you bring these individuals here tonight? Not just because of the good work, um, but also because um, WIC in our health department has partnered, and we were at that ribbon cutting as well, and USD 500 is partner as well, I take it. And so that is, Commissioner Davis, one of those spaces. But as we know, they're asking, we need many more spaces because I've always said the first step to hope, the second step to uh, opportunity, and the third step to an improved destiny starts with an education. And you all are doing that groundwork, um, boots on the ground, um, to really hit those areas, like you said, in between families um, and uh, kindergarten. Um, and we all know that the data is out there that shows that early childhood education really has a profound positive impact on people's lives. And as these children grow from that education, they tend to be more productive uh, in our communities. Uh, and so it's really valuable, the work that you're doing. So thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, Commissioner Bynum is on, on deck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just, Dr. Nevels and, and team, thanks for presenting tonight. I love the read, play, learn spaces. I am active with my Kiwanis Club here in Wyandotte County, which is the Kiwanis Club of KCK West and literacy and nutrition are two of our top priorities. We work primarily serving children in the community and we have placed in the courthouse three uh, little free libraries and uh, they are well used. We can barely keep them stocked with books. So I would reach out to you through my Kiwanis membership and see if we can't partner better with you in what you're doing and probably ask you to come to one of our upcoming meetings and be a speaker and present this program to us so that we can identify how to partner better with you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner uh, Keel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to say to Dr. Nevels and the team, thank you so much for the presentation. As you know, this is part of my uh, love and heart is education for the kids. And starting out as kindergartners with 
them learning to read and being excited about it in various spaces is just awesome. I wish it was available a hundred years ago when my kids were in kindergarten. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you all okay. so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for your presentation. That takes us to item number five. Um, and I'll ask uh, Chief of Staff Irene Cadu to come and she'll do a presentation about appointments to boards and commissions. Mayor, Commissioners, County Administrator, Irene Gaudio, back for the second round. Um, it is always an honor to stand before you, but I wanted to come and really affirm um, the presentation I made uh, to you last month and, and really say that it can be done. Uh, mayor's appointments are will be complete tonight in your consent agenda. Uh, when I think about uh, Commissioner Burns, one of his, uh, I think, um, first uh, things was to make sure he was uh, uh, either, either reappointing or finding appointments for his position. I'm not going to call the rest of you out, but I will say it can be done. But I want to remind you uh, very much in a, in a sense that the Legislative Auditor's Office uh, has a report for the new commissioners. Um, you can see it in the commission office that really emphasized um, the board seats that were vacant and some longstanding. But even after that uh, presentation last month, some of the commission, the some of the board and commission chairs even indicated that those vacancies hurt quorums. So in trying to move things forward in these commissions, um, it, it becomes very hard to do, or at least do the work that we want in regard to opportunities for our community to represent and be a voice uh, at the table on some of the most important issues. Um, so many of you, I think many times we tend to focus the attention on those uh, appointments that, um, that people want to be a part of, the golf advisory, they want to be a part of the housing authority, because that's kind of what we hear a lot about. Um, as we mentioned last month, there are plenty of more. But when I looked at the legislative, um, the legislative audit, along with some of the chairs, there, there were at least four that popped up. Um, of course, we, we all know the, can't, the housing authority and everyone either will ask you to be on the board or find a way to be on that board um, because it is about low income, moderate individuals and really cre creating some sustainability. But the ones that seem to be affected by quorum and have some vacancies are the human relations and disabilities, um, which is really to foster mutual understanding, respect, and relations among racial, of course, religion, ethnic, and minority groups. Um, those uh, check out your uh, um, appointments because there's some vacancies there. Um, the Wyandotte Leavenworth uh, County Area Advisory Council on Aging um, that helps with the planning, coordination, and advocacy has some uh, vacancies there. The Law Enforcement Advisory Board, particularly for the new commissioners, you've got some appointments to make there, and they are having quorum issues. Um, so, and, you know, great start to a year. They're trying to finish their, their final report and they advise and assist in policy development, education, community outreach, sheriff and, and police uh, chief come every month uh, for back and forth conversation and, and important. Um, and then we all know the Board of Parks Commission is one that I think everyone will say, that's what I want to, to be on, which advises the Parks and Rec. So we know about planning and zoning and some other ones, but those are commonly known boards. And what I want to remind you in particular is um, to work with the administrative assistants in, uh, in your uh, commission office uh, to assist you uh, with the vacancies that you have, but also don't be hesitant with your peers or with the mayor's office that we can help you get it done. 
like we did in the mayor's office. Let's get it done. So there, uh, but but I want to tonight was really more important because I skimmed over the two um, uh, that that you approved last month, um, and the mayor is actually requesting that we we take each of you take thirty days to make a commitment to identify um, uh, an a, an actual individual. Uh, in these, and one is the Economic Development Advisory Committee, and that was the one you approved with um, uh, involving the Quindaro uh, Ruins Project area. But it also um, is really big on strategizing and dealing with Eastern Wyandotte County, including Northeast, downtown, historical neighborhoods of, of Armadale, Strawberry Hill, and uh, Russian Hill. So if you remember, the idea was that this one really would be a composition uh, that would include an appointment by the mayor and all of you as commissioners with representation of professionals. Um, so it, it was specific in identifying um, those in the field of economics, economic development, finance, historical pre preservation, and law. So it could include some unified government officials, but it is now your time to really think about how you identify a community to represent uh, that particular board. The other is, of course, our Community Benefits Advisory Board. Though the action will come later, the idea is that we begin work so that we're ready to work. Uh, and this one consisted, of course, again, uh, each of you appointing a member of our community, um, residents of the county, Oh, and they could also include owners of businesses in your specific areas um, and actually represent um, the, the purpose of the advisory board ensures that development projects in Wyandotte County benefit and promote economic growth and prosperity for our residents with these designated funds that will be collected uh, to disperse within uh, three areas. Um, and recommendations will go from this advisory board actually to the Economic Development and Finance Standing Commit, uh, Commission Committee. Mm -hmm. So commissioners, um, and again, I speak out to residents that are listening here, either in the audience or at home because they do call and have called. Um, uh, it is, it is so important to offer this opportunity and really garner shared lived experience of those that are uh, in our community, don't often be, uh, get asked to be uh, have seats at the table um, and voice and represent for a better Wyandotte County. So I thank you for listening and any help that the mayor's office can provide, please let me help. Thank you. Thank you, Chief of Staff. Uh, we have a question, Ms. Cadillo, Commissioner Ramirez. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Chief of Staff Cadillo. Um, we've known each other for a while now. You can call me out anytime you'd like. <laughs> but um, just to give you an update on mine, I got four more and then I'm done. So I'm almost there. And uh, Commissioner Burns makes it seems like we're all slacking up here. <laughs> he was the first one to get all of his on the, on the agenda. But thank you for keeping us updated on this and keeping us on on track to get these. Because uh, these, these boards, as some may think, they may not be important, but they are. Because they help not only help us as a commission to make decisions, provide us recommendations, but also brings in the citizens into the civ into civic engagement, yes. it brings their voices into the process. So thank you for keeping us on track. No, thank you. We, we do appreciate it. I just know that uh, we've talked about the difficulties. Um, I think there's some opportunity that, uh, again, as I mentioned last month, to use each other's networks, but also just call out to the community because they should be calling you because they definitely do call the mayor um, and ask for certain up. So we've been uh, built, rebuilding our task force, but I think there's some people out there willing to, to give time and, and talent to help 
uh, particularly uh, our, our unified government staff as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this takes us to our next two items, items number six and seven. And I just have to start off by apologizing to the commission. Um, normally, I try and get things to you all uh, in a way to where you all can make an informed decision. This one was kind of easy. Um, it's kind of straightforward and to the point. Um, what we found out just looking at things, um, we found out that both uh, the DA and the Register of Deeds uh, elected positions were left out of uh, parity as well as uh, cost of living increases. And so uh, when that came to my attention, um, uh, pretty much at the last minute I got with legal and legal did a real good job of, uh, and I'd have to just say kudos to that team of really looking at the ordinances and realizing that that was the case and that there was an opportunity um, to bring um, some of our elected officials up to parity. I know we've done that with the sheriff and I know um, in years past the mayor and I believe the commission were brought up as well, but this is an opportunity um, to bring um, some of our electeds uh, up to parity in a way that uh, uh, better reflects uh, their day-to-day -day duties uh, as it's been established in, in the ordinances. But again, I apologize, but again, this is really about uh, uh, parity for our elected officials and uh, there might be more to come, but this is a, a first uh, step to make sure that uh, they're included in, in the same type of benefits that we've been afforded um, and our staff as well that was approved through the budget last year of increases, but then also adding the parity component onto those elected officials that uh, have been without for uh, a considerable amount of time. So the first item, which is number six, um, is um, a resolution amending section 2-142 of the Code of Ordinances pertaining to the salary of the Register of Deeds. Um, and I'll ask our legal counsel to make some remarks. Yes, the um, ordinance, the proposed ordinance in front of you, um, if you go to the second page, um, section two, it places the register of deeds um, to be equal to the mayor's salary. So it takes out the amount and then because the mayor receives the cost of living, then that just automatically would follow along. So that section was removed. And then the deputy um, was given a higher numerical value and that number was derived from the um, chiefs of staff for the mayor. And so since that could change in the future, that would be, it would not fluctuate with the chief of staff, but then would go on to um, incur any cost of living adjustments um, and or performance evaluation adjustments. And so those were the two changes um, that the mayor had asked for in the, in this ordinance. Okay, do any members of the commission have any comments or questions? Commissioner Maris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't have any question, questions, more comment going to what you're saying about, you know, giving us time. Um, like I support this and, but I ask moving, Moving forward, if we go through the committee process, because that also allows for a more robust conversation, allows the community to have public comment on these ordinances. Um, we have a committee system for a reason, so I ask that we use it um, because I, I say again, I don't have a problem voting on this, but I just first night seeing it, reading new ordinances, we're changing our code and we're just getting, and I know it's apology and you're, last minute, um, but as you said, is there, there may be more coming, I ask that those go through the committee process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for approval of the resolution. There's a motion, uh, got a Commissioner Burns. Second. We have a motion and a council. Can, can you pull the mic up? Here? Sorry, it's not my normal mic. <laughs> um, to clarify, it should have been entitled resolution and ordinance. 
So I'd ask that the motion include resolution and ordinance. Yes. Thank you. And the same with the next one. My apologies. Okay. Uh, before I move, uh, uh, Commissioner Kane, do you want to restate that motion? Yeah, that's what the chair said. <laughs> okay, that's, that works. That works. <laughs> Uh, before we move on, there is a motion in a second, but I will allow for a question by Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. I've been away too long. As many of you know, I've <laughs> been absent for a while for a family tragedy. Uh, I just have to say I may or may not have a problem, but I just think I would need more time to review what this is. Uh, that's the concern I have with it. I don't know what it says with just being presented with this. There being, may be no problem at all, but I think these things should go through committee. Um, and I would not feel comfortable voting for it, not knowing what it says. So if one uh, of my constituents wanted to know, well, what did you just vote on and why did you vote it? I couldn't tell them because I've just been presented with this. Uh, would it be so detrimental that this be sent to committee instead of voted on tonight? Is there a particular reason these have to be acted on tonight? Well, they're pretty straightforward, Commissioner. I mean, it's but I just, just haven't had time to, to read it and really see that I mean, that's the question. I mean, they may very well be. It, it's in uh, front of you. There's less than three sentences. And it really says, I mean, I could give it to a fifth grader. And they could understand that it's a parity issue and a well and a maybe they could and i don't but, and i don't mean any disrespect well that's that. what it sounded like though no no disrespect it sounded, this looks like more than three pages to me and when i what let, let me finish what it includes is the actual ordinance and the the additions are the 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 areas that have been outlined as far as um uh what is to be changed there is no change to the ordinance other than what is standing in directly in front of you. And it is not a lot of language. It's very distinct, it's direct, it's thorough, um, and it, it's self-explanatory. Well, I, as I said before, Mayor, um, I read the entire ordinance when everything is presented. I understand that there are certain things that are uh, scratched through and, and Others not, but just haven't had time to read that. And I devote attention to whoever's in front of us. And I would still wonder if this is not something that could go through the committee. Well, it's here tonight and, and no disrespect again, Commissioner. And, and I do appreciate your question. Um, when I brought this forward, we tried to make sure that it was very clear and as distinct, there's not a lot of changes to it. But um, because of when I caught that everyone else, including this commission and our staff received these pay raises um, and these individuals were left out. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that they've got the same opportunity to um, have parity and increases um, just as all of us have been um, afforded. That was approved through the budget. And so it's a matter of fairness and parity um, and there's nothing else with that um, to make sure that they're in line and that they're being paid um, considerably equivalent to the, to the type of work that they do uh, amongst their peers. Could they not be paid retroactively if this went through committee? Uh, I believe it could, but I've, I've made the decision to bring it here to this body tonight. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. There is a motion and a second. Clerk, roll call. Roll call. Townsend? No. Fine. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to our next item. And it's the last item on the mayor's agenda. Um, it's the approval of resolution of salary, salary parity for the district attorney. Again, I know we've taken care of the sheriff to make sure that he was in line. As, and these are our top public safety law enforcement officials in the county um, and the DA being at the top of that food chain, um, it would be, and he's another one that did not, um, when it came to my attention, um, receive any type of parity or increase. And so um, when that came, um, again, it, it's straightforward. And so uh, same situation as item number six. 
and I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval. Kane, second. We have a motion. And is that with the same clarification yes. that it's resolution? resolution? Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, again, just to be clear, that is a motion for the resolution and the ordinance, correct? Yes. Sir. We have a yes, and that's second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk Roll Call. Roll Call. Townsend? No. Burns? Yes. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We will now proceed with the items on the planning and zoning portion of the agenda. Um, and tonight we have two distinct parts of our meeting. The planning and zoning portion will be handled, followed by the regular commission meeting. I ask the clerk to read the statements required by state law governing the planning and zoning portion of the meeting, followed by the items on the planning and zoning consent agenda. Clerk, uh, can you give the, your statement and disclosures? Good evening. We would like to welcome all present to the meeting of the Unified Government Commission. Members of the commission are Mayor CEO Tyrone Garner, Commissioner Melissa Bynum at Large District 1, Commissioner Tom Burroughs at Large District 2, Commissioner Gail Townsend, District 1, Commissioner Bill Burns, District 2, Commissioner Christian Ramirez, District 3, Commissioner Evelyn Hill, District 4, Commissioner Mike Kane, District 5, Commissioner Phil Lopez, District 6, Commissioner Chuck Stites, District 7, and Commissioner Andrew Davis, District 8. As each petition is called, all persons for or against will be given the opportunity to express their views. If this is the first time that a particular petition has been before the commission, the commission has three options. Number one, it can approve the recommendation of the planning commission with six votes. Number two, it can override the planning commission's recommendation but it would take eight votes to override. Number three, it can return the matter to the Planning Commission for further consideration, together with a statement specifying the reasons for the referral back to the Planning Commission. The consent agenda is the first part of the planning and zoning agenda. Items on the consent agenda have received a unanimous vote of recommendation by the Planning Commission. Unless there is a request to set aside an item from the consent agenda by the applicant, a member of the public, the Unified Government Commission or others, then the Planning Commission's recommendation on all of the items on the consent agenda will be adopted by the Unified Government Commission at one time. I will read the list of agenda items on the consent agenda, and when I have completed the list, the mayor will ask if there are any requests to set aside items from the consent agenda. This is your time to come to the microphone and provide the agenda item to be set aside if you do not agree with the Planning Commission's recommendation. If you're joining us virtually, this is your time to raise your hand and once acknowledged, provide the agenda item to be set aside. If you contacted the UG clerk's office, that item will be set aside by the UG clerk on your behalf. If an item is set aside, the matter will be discussed and voted on separately. All items not set aside will be approved with the Planning Commission's recommendation. We appreciate the attendance of those people here this evening and we recognize the importance of each petition. We would, however, remind you that there are a number of items on the agenda and would appreciate your efforts to make your remarks as concise as possible. We ask that anyone with a cell phone please turn them off or switch to non-audio so you will not disturb the meeting. If joining us virtually or by phone, we ask that you mute your phone when not speaking to avoid background noise so you will not disturb the meeting. Once the petitioner makes their presentation, anyone for or against will be allowed the maximum three minutes to state their views. As you come to the microphone, please state your name and city for the record if attending in person. This is your time again to raise your hand if you're joining us virtually. When your name is called, please state your name and city for the record. The mayor and commission are required to disclose contacts with proponents or opponents on any item on the planning and zoning agenda. At this time, does any member of the commission wish to disclose any contact with proponents or opponents on any item on the agenda? Okay, Mayor sure Bynum. Mayor, I've had communication from opponents on the non-consent change of zone 2023-027, uh, proponents and opponents on non-consent special use 2023-079, 
and opponents of PR 2023-034 and MPL 2023-017 that goes with it. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stikes. Proponents of uh, COZ 2023-027 and also PR 2023-028. Thank you, Commissioner Ramirez. I have received communication from opponents of PR 2023-034 and its companion application MPL 2023-017. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I've received communications uh, for proponents and opponents of SP 2023-079, uh, PR 2023-034, and its companion MPL 2023-017. Thank you, Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Mayor. Much like the others, uh, COZ 2023-027, opponents, and zero three, four, uh, the uh, proponents and opponents both. Thank you. Commissioner Hill. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I received um, communication on SP 2023-079. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stites. I've come back to the, I can't find it. There's one more that I need to disclose, but I can't find it. Sorry. Okay. Do any of the members of the commission? I'm sorry, Commissioner Kane. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Heard your mic. Sorry, Mayor. COZ 2023-27 opponents, PR 2023-028 uh, opponents as well. Thank you. Okay. Do any members of the commission, the county administrator, the public wishes set aside any item on the planning and zoning? Getting ahead of myself. Uh, clerk, could you read the consent agenda? Yes, Mayor, I'll now read the items on the consent agenda. Change of zone applications, item A1, COZ 2023-021, Grant Leslie, change of zone from C1 limited business and R1 single family district, to RP5 planned apartment district to operate a mental health care facility at 6111 Leavenworth Road, recommended for approval to RP4 planned garden apartment district. Item A2, COZ 2023-029, Lydia Nabell, change of zone from R1 single family district to AG agricultural district to expand the Casey Farm School at 4105 Gibbs Road, recommended for approval. Item special use permits, item B1, SP 2023-058, Grant Leslie, special use permit for a group home at 6111 Leavenworth Road, recommended for approval for two years. Item B2, SP 2023-102, Hardy Shoals with 403 Club, renewal of a special use permit to continue to operate a drinking establishment with live entertainment at 614 Reynolds Avenue, recommended for approval for five years. Item B3, SP 2023-104, Alyssa Scherfel, home occupation special use permit for a cottage bakery at 1206 North 132nd Street, recommended for approval for two years. Item B4, SP 2023-105, David Dial, special use permit for a short-term rental at 4509 Garfield Avenue, recommended for approval for one year. Item B5, SP 2023-107, Sharista Strother with Early Learners Academy, special use permit to operate a daycare within the Boys and Girls Club at 1220 Troop Avenue, recommended for approval for two years. Miscellaneous ordinances. Item one, an ordinance rezoning property located at approximately 443R South 88th Street from R1 single family district to MP3 planned heavy industrial district, recommended for approval. Item two, an ordinance rezoning property located at approximately 9700 State Avenue from AG Agricultural District to CP2 planned general business district, recommended for approval. 
Item three, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for grading, fill, removal of earthen, earthen fill at 9700 State Avenue, recommended for approval. Item four, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for the continuation of an auto body shop at 744 Kansas Avenue, recommended for approval. Item five, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 2559 West 46th Avenue, recommended for approval. Item six, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a drinking establishment with live entertainment at 5235 State Avenue, recommended for approval. Item seven, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 2501 North Tremont Street, recommended for approval. Item eight, an ordinance authorizing a home occupation special use permit for a wig making business at 8127 Troop Avenue, number 106, recommended for approval. Item nine, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 508 Ohio Avenue, recommended for approval. Item 10, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 1918 Federal Avenue, recommended for approval. Item 11, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for the continuation of a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 419 North 6th Street, recommended for approval. Item 12, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a drinking establishment at 412 to 414 North 5th Street, recommended for approval. Item 13, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a drinking establishment at 1200 Osage Avenue, recommended for approval. Item 14, an ordinance authorizing a home occupation special use permit for an instrument repair business at 1108 Shawnee Road, recommended for approval. Item 15, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 4211 South Thompson, recommended for approval. Item 16, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a used truck dealership business at 1701 South 45th Street, recommended for approval. Item 17, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 625 Northrop Avenue, recommended for approval. Item 18, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 535 Central Avenue, recommended for approval. Item 19, an ordinance authorizing a special use permit for a non-owner occupied short-term rental at 4110 South Mini Street, recommended for approval. This represents all the items on the consent agenda. Thank you, Clark. <clears throat> Do any members of the commission, the county administrator, the public wish to set aside any item on the planning and zoning consent agenda? If an item is not set aside, all items on the planning and zoning consent agenda will be voted on by one vote to follow the recommendation of the planning commission. Move for approval for all items. Borough second. Okay. I'll accept those for now, but uh, I ask anyone in attendance, um, would you like to set aside any item? And so please state your name and city for the record. Clerk, is anyone joining us virtually you'd like to set an item aside? No hands are raised. Okay, there is a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion? Saying none, Clerk, roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. This takes us to the planning and zoning non-consent agenda. And the first item, Clerk, could you read that in its entirety? Change of, change of zone application one, COZ 2023-027, Alex Elliott with Atlas Land Consultants, change of zone from R1 single family district to RP4 planned garden apartment district to develop a senior living facility at 9205 Garfield Avenue, recommended for approval with a vote of five to three. I'll ask staff to make some open remarks, Mr. Hand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design. Again, this is a proposed project to rezone from R1 to RP4 Garden Apartments for a three-phased senior living center. 
This case was remanded back to the City Planning Commission at the Board of Commissioners November 2023 hearing. It was heard again at the December City Planning Commission. It was before you all this evening for reconsideration. In between the December um, City Planning Commission and this hearing, the, a protest petition was filed. It was reviewed by staff and, derm, and deemed invalid. It did not meet the standard for the area uh, in opposition around the proposed project. 20% was required, 13.75% was obtained. This is in the Prairie Delaware Piper area plan. Staff received no letters in support. There was opposition predominantly from the single family neighborhood to the east. There are no notices of violation on this property. Staff agrees with planning commission recommends approval with conditions, including pedestrian connections um, to the existing sidewalk network. It will have to come back for a final development plan and to follow the multifamily design guidelines. I do believe the applicant is going to request a holdover. Thank you. Uh, applicant, if you're present. Okay, clerk, could you uh, acknowledge the applicant? Mr. Hi, Alex. yes, this is <clears throat> this is Alex Elliott with Outside Consulting, 14500 Parallel Road, Unit R. Um, we were originally going to um, request a holdover, but after talking to um, Byron Toy, um, we're going to go ahead and go through and get a vote on this today. Um, as uh, we got mentioned, um, there has been some opposition. Um, we didn't have any opposition at the neighborhood meeting um, from any of the adjacent neighbors, but at the following commission meeting and everything, there was some opposition. And it seems like the main concern from opposition is um, traffic volume from the uh, you know proposed senior or assisted living facilities. Um, at the planning commission meeting, we showed an exhibit where we put together a um, basically a single family layout. The, the main argument from the opposition was that if this was to remain a single family, you know, that would be better than what is proposed because single family would be lower traffic. Um, we put together a quick layout. I can show it again if, if we'd like, but um, basically per the county standards doing a single family layout and the um, projected daily trips were actually double what is proposed currently with the assisted living. Um, assisted living, even though it is RP4, which sounds really intimidating, um, assisted living has very low um, traffic generation. Uh, that's because you know most of the people living there do not drive. Um, and you can see that from the amount of parking that we provide. It's like um, basically one parking space for every four beds. So the assumption is that only a quarter of the residents will actually be driving. Um, so, you know, obviously our position is that, you know, this proposed use is actually lower traffic generation than it could be as it exists with R1. Um, and, you know, Public Works has reviewed our traffic, original traffic memo, um, and said that that existing road is, is good to go for proposed volumes. And so with that, we uh, are requesting approval. Thank you. I'll now open the public hearing. Clerk, have you received any notifications from the public who wish to express their comments in favor of the item? No comments received. Is there anyone present who'd like to speak in favor of the item? Okay. Is there anyone joining us virtually who'd like to speak in favor of the item? No hands are raised. Clerk, have you received any notifications from the public who wish to express their comments in opposition to the item? No comments received. Is there anyone present like to speak in opposition to this item? Yes. If so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record, as well as your city. Yes, a resident. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Name is Gary Johnson, Kansas City, Kansas resident, longtime resident. I totally disagree with what they said for as the number of percentage that disagree. What I have here is I had received that there was 25 letters that went out. Of those 25 letters that went out to the public, let no, notifying them of the change, 
three were interesting parties. One was the practitioner himself, two were possible sellers of the property, and one was possibly a buyer. That is 11 out of the 25. That leaves you 18 people or 18 letters that went out and said that did not have anything that was not involved in the buying, selling, changing, developing, or purchasing of the property. That left you 18, 18 letters. Of those 18 letters, two of them belonged to one person. They came in their name and they also came in their name as a trustee. That left you 17, 17, 17 people who were not involved with the uh, property. Of those 17, 14 of those 17 signed a petition against that property being changed over. 14. I had two people who were out of town who came back to Kansas City uh, from St. Louis to make sure that their names were on the petition as record to showing that they were against it. Their property back up directly to the property that you're talking about. One minute remaining. Okay. Of that, we went around and it, it, it involves more than the 17 people that was actually there. You have 48 to 50 people that lives in that de development. It's Sunset Ridge. Out of those, we went around and got 48 signatures from those people who said they were against it. Now, I'm gonna be truthful with you, I'm gonna be honest. Not all were totally against the, the building or the structure of the senior assistant living building, but all of them were against them using just that one spro. We have a demographic of people there, young, old, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, people with children. And I live in the first house and I see those kids coming down there, down that street to catch the bus and coming back. I see the transportation that goes through there. Your time right has across expired. the street, there is a VA clinic. That VA clinic is busy and it's getting busier. I'm gonna ask you to vote no on this. They are asking that. Most of those people said, hey, I'm not against the senior citizen living, assistant living, but just put in another road. Don't use that street. Thank you. I appreciate my time. What are your questions? There's no question, but thank you. Thank you. My name is Lawrence Harvey. I also live in Kansas, Kansas. I'm one of the, the 48 petitioners that signed on this uh, against it. I live in that area. I know the road, people coming in now. I've been around assisted living per property. You have more traffic than what they're saying. I just ask for you to under, you know, to vote no for something that we see and they are wanting something done that they're not looking at. They're not there every day. You know, we travel that road. They don't. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse Villarreal. I live here in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, you know, I don't even really know these folks. I don't live in their neighborhood. But time and time, I sit here in these meetings or online and I listen to these meetings and I see things like this happen where their HOA was not officially notified of these meetings or of these plans. I myself has been, have been in the scenario where a protest petition was denied. We provided a protest petition for an upcoming commission meeting well in advance of the meeting itself. And we're not told that it was denied for honestly, errors on the part of Mr. Han's office until the day of the commission meeting. 
these folks turned in their protest petition well over a week ago. And again, here we are sitting here and Mr. Han didn't even have the courtesy of notifying them that they didn't have the, the percentage they needed to even make a difference. So essentially all these people wasted their time and had no idea. That's really frustrating. And when that happened to me, I sat down with Commissioner Bynum and Commissioner Davis and the council. And I sat up on the ninth floor and we discussed how three times prior to mine being denied, protest petitions have been an issue when it comes to planning and zoning. So at what point is something gonna change so that these people, myself included, these tax paying citizens feel like they have an edge because what it sounds like and feels like to me is that the edge is all here and it's with the developers because it always feels like the, the cards are in their favor. It's almost like they're working for them. And I can't quite figure why that is because in our, our case, the developer wasn't even gonna pay taxes. He was gonna be a 501c3. But there is a fundamental issue with your constituents, the taxpayers, not getting a fair shake when it comes to being educated. I flat out reached out to Mr. Hand when my situation happened and said, how do I protest this? He what never told me I had a right to appeal, never told me. So I sit here and I watch this time and time again, and it's real frustrating. So I don't have to know them to know how it feels. It's important to these people. This is a neighborhood that's just from my doing my own education is a one way in one way out. And it's a senior living facility. So it doesn't take someone smarter than a fifth grader to realize that when you have emergency vehicles going to tend to people of older age, that's going to be a real logistical challenge. I would, I would really request at least a traffic study be done on this. I mean, I think that's fair, at least fair to the taxpaying people that are in, in opposition to this. So thank you very much. Okay. Clerk, is there anyone joining us virtually like speaking speak in opposition to the item? No hands are raised. I will now close the public hearing. Petitioner, closing remarks. Yeah, this is Alex Elliott again. That was saying consulting. Um, just to address some of the concerns that came up. A traffic study was done. Um, basically, a traffic memo was prepared um, comparing the projected traffic volumes of the of the um, proposed assisted living facility and taking into account the existing traffic load of the existing subdivision. Now, um, your average two lane road, like the one that exists there, 92nd Street, um, is capable of handling around a thousand trips a day. Um, the combined total after this development is, would be fully phased out would be around 700 trips per day. So still a lot of capacity left in that road. Um, the owner estimates talking to other um, assisted living owners that um, they have around two ambulance trips a month, two trips a month. Um, not very many trips from the ambulance there. Um, a lot of capacity left in that road. In that road. Um, the other concern um, with the neighborhood list, um, basically the, the people who are sent letters, uh, that list comes from the unified government. You know, they, they tell us who to send the letters to, we send the letters that's all it is. We didn't intentionally leave, any, leave anybody out. We just sent people, sent the required neighbor list letters, and that's what we did. So, um, and I believe, and Gunnar can correct me on this, but I, I don't believe there is a HOA in that subdivision. Um, so, of course, that, you know, there was no HOA to notify. Um, so, there's the disparity there. But um, besides that, uh, if the main concern is traffic, you know, we've, we've shown based on numbers provided by the Institute of Traffic Engineers. You know, they, they study traffic generation across the country. Um, they put these numbers together. We didn't just come up with these on our own. And using their numbers, you know, there, there's still plenty of, of capacity on the road. So with that, we, we don't think it would uh, cause any undue hardship on the, the existing subdivision. That's all I've got. Thank you. Do any members of the commission have any questions? Commissioner King. Okay, you guys can't talk, but you can nod your head whether you have a home association. And and something else that, that, that's frustrating, 
just because they only had to send it to, to, to within 200 feet, that's a whole community that's affected, not just ones that are buttoned up to the property. And, and it's frustrating for me because I've seen more petitions denied than I've seen passed. I would also be pissed if I didn't find out till I got to the commission meeting that it didn't work. So we got some holes that we need to fill and, and figure this out. And, and, and like the guy said, there's no HOH. All right, and obviously there is, right? So it, it frustrates me for multiple things. Or HOH, it's more than the people that are affected and it's like this guy don't care. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my comments are gonna mirror a little bit of Commissioner Kane's of, um, I think, I, I know we get a briefing sheet every week and I know on the briefing sheet, one of those things I believe is from your office is to look at the petition process. Um, it seems that there needs to be a lot more work. We need to research it more, inform it, see if there are ways to make it better, to make it more accessible for our community members. Um, it's there for a reason. It's their voice. And so we need to make sure that we're using it in the right way and if it needs to be changed. So I would lend my help in any way to you, Mr. Mayor, for to help with that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner uh, Stikes. Well, we'll kind of bite my tongue a little bit here because I think Commissioner Kane did a good job at uh, the concerns here. The The petition process, um, I, it appears that it's there's some flaws in it. Um, I, I agree that um, I would be frustrated if I got here tonight to find out that you didn't have a um, valid petition and that your HOA wasn't recognized through this process. Um, I'm not sure um, why that is, but it needs addressed. We need to fix it. Um, the other thing, you know, as far as us reaching out or, or the petitioner reaching out to the applicant, I guess, um, to just the, ones that he's required to do. You know, we ask, we sit up here and ask people all the time for just an Airbnb. Well, did you go to the, did you have a group meet? Did you have a, a meeting? Did you reach out? Did you offer it in Spanish? Did you do this, this, and this? And that's for one single house for an Air Airbnb. And I think that we need to also hold um, the, the developers accountable to doing a little bit more than just what's required. Um, and that's my my opinion. I think it, it goes a long way with establishing uh, relationships with the with the neighbors, with the people that live in and around that area. Um, so it's frustrating to hear that uh, uh, what has been uh, presented this this evening. With that being said, I make a oh let me ask this. I want to I want to find out um, legal to override. Planning Commission's um, vote on this, it would require a supermajority, correct? Eight, yes. So, yes? Yes. Okay. I make a motion to deny COZ 2023-027 on the points that it doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood. For a second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. I'm, before we get into that, I'm gonna recognize Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I just have two questions. Uh, Mr. Hand, what, what happened with the protest petition process? The reason that the project was remanded back to the city um, planning commission 
was to give the uh, two gentlemen who spoke time to fill out the protest petition. We spoke with them, which is why we asked for it to be remanded back last December that they wanted to do a protest petition. I connected them with staff who review the rules of the protest petition, which are governed by state statute. Again, it's not the number of people adjacent, it's the land area. So there are three property owners on the three sides of this proposed parcel that did not want to sign that protest petition, which counted for a majority of the land area, 90 plus percent. So less than 20, 80 plus percent, excuse me. So last year before Mr. Waters left, the mayor had directed him to look at the protest petition after the issues stated in testimony this evening. Mr. Waters concluded our ordinance did not need to be updated at that time. And he worked with us to update the protest petition packet and its instructions to be more clear and concise and direct and provide all the caveats that go with this complicated process. We used that revised protest petition packet for this case. And we have this result. Okay, gotcha. Because I think that came, that meeting with Mr. Waters, I remember meeting with him, came out of my meetings with constituents regarding uh, regarding the, the Cernish development. Uh, one more question, is the, the developer still here? Do we know? So I just have a question for you, sir, because there, there has been a motion to basically deny this. Is it all or nothing regarding that extra road? Because as I hear from folks, they're saying they're okay with the development, but put another road. Do I have that kind of, do I have that, put another road in addition, two roads in and out. So I'm assuming, sir, you've spent quite a bit of money, you've spent quite a lot of time, and we vote on this, we, we shut it down. Is it all or nothing for you? Uh, so first of all, I'm not the developer. I'm, the, um, I'm actually the engineer on the project, and we're just representing the developer through this process. Um, but it's not even an option. This property does not go all the way through to 94th Street. It did previously, and the previous property owner split it off to where now the, the only access that this property has is onto 90, or well, Garfield Avenue, which connects to 92nd Street. So it, it is the only option. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Hill. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Han, um, in, in regards to getting back to the neighborhood constituents, what is the process for that? I'm new, so I may, it's probably written somewhere, but I don't, I don't know it yet. I apologize. Governor Han, Director of Planning and Urban Design. Obviously, our lead planners work with the um, applicant and the community to the best of our ability, by the time it reaches the Board of Commissioners hearing, it is obviously your meeting, not the meeting that I administer with the City Planning Commission. As such, it's run by the City Clerk. We provided the protest petition and our analysis of it to the City Clerk. That's what the ordinance requires. Okay, so I, I just bear with me for a minute. So you're saying it's not your responsibility, correct? It's the city clerk's responsibility to get back to the neighborhood constituents. I'm just trying to understand. The ordinance speaks to it in that nature as there's a separation between city planning commission and board of commissioners PNZ meeting. So all notifications for the board of commissioners hearing goes through the city clerk. Very often we'll get comments and letters and stuff up to the day of the Board of Commissioners hearing, we always make sure to copy the city clerk because they keep the file once it gets past City Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ramirez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. To jump off of uh, Commissioner Hills, is that stated in the packet that all of that, the comments after PNZ have to be forwarded to the city clerk and that they will hear back from the city clerk? Is that stated in the packet? Which packet are you talking about? The, the protest petition packet. Um, 
I'd have to re-review it. I'm not 100% sure. Because if it's not, then that would be, we would need to put that in that packet of information so the constituents know that after P and Z, if you apply for a protest petition, all your information, everything should go to the city clerk by city ordinance and that it's the clerk's office to notify, not planning and zone, not planning. Uh, I can if, double check. Okay. And again, if that's not, if it's not in there, then we definitely need to put that in there because I think that's where the confusion is coming from. They're sending everything to your office when by process it's supposed it should be sent to the clerk's office. And if legal, if we could clarify that as well, whose responsibility is for after PNZ before it comes to us where protest petition, where their information and who notifies who. Uh, I think that'd be good if we can have some legal clarification on that. Thank you. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call, Townsend? Aye. Burns? No. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. There's one a, a clarification. Declare the motion was to deny the application. Yes. Well denied. Yes. Yes. Well denied. Okay. So if you say yes, you're you're saying yes to support the motion to deny um, the, the initiative. So yes. Kane. Aye. Lopez. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Commissioner Burns, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, in the clarification on how to vote, I vote aye. Okay. For the record, if you can. The record reflect that uh, Commissioner Burns uh, voted uh, yes to deny the application. Thank you. Before I go any further, this was brought up by a constituent, uh, Commissioner Townsend. I used inappropriate lingo that was associated with my past profession. That was not intended to slight you or disrespect you. And I want to apologize not only to the public, but to you. Um, so I spoke out of turn. Please blame that on my mind and not my heart. I, I consider you a friend and a professional. And so that was not done to slight in any way. And I respect your vote and your position. And that was not done to disrespect you in any way. And so I just want the record to reflect that, um, that uh, that was not done to slight you. That past professions I had when we talk policy and we write policy, we speak to that. But it's in, it is inappropriate for this venue and as I grow and learn, uh, to do better, you have to know better. And now I know better. So uh, hopefully we'll take the words of both our governor and Sister Therese and we'll become goldfish. Well, I, I won't uh, agree to goldfish, but I accept your apology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. That takes us to our next item. And that is uh, B1. Clerk, could you read that in its entirety? <clears throat> Special use permit SP 2023-079 Karina West. Renewal of a special use permit to keep ducks on the property at 1921 Nebraska Avenue. Recommended for approval for five years with a vote of six to two. Okay, I'll ask staff to make some remarks. Mr. Hand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Design. Again, this is a special use permit uh, to allow more than what is required, uh, allowed by right foul uh, on the property. This would be uh, the applicant's first renewal, second approval. This is in the Northeast KCK area plan. Staff has received both support and opposition. There are some older notices of violation on the property. All have been addressed prior to the approval process uh, by the applicant. Staff agrees with Planning Commission's recommendation for approval with for five years with conditions, eight ducks, up to 40 ducklings. I do believe the applicant is going to request an amendment to that recommendation. Thank you. Uh, 
I'll ask the applicant or representative to present uh, their application. So let me bring up your presentation. I submitted slides. Yeah. So my name is Karina West. I live in 1921, Nebraska. I'm asking for 15 ducks, 15 adult ducks. And next slide. At the planning commission vote, they recommended eight adult ducks plus 40 ducklings. So I'm asking for a clarification of eight adult ducks plus 40 juveniles aged three to 16 weeks because it's the ducklings under three weeks aren't causing the problem. And planning staff says they are amenable to this change of eight adult ducks plus 40 juveniles aged three to 16 weeks. I am asking for 12 or 15 adult ducks plus 40 juveniles aged three to 16 weeks. So planning staff recommended if we moved it up to 12 or 15 adult ducks that it was a two year term. Um, and planning staff recommended a five year term on the eight adults. So either of those two second options are allowable to me and uh, won't be showing up at anyone's house if either of those are passed. Um, but next slide. So we USA duck team is a very small hatchery and urban farm in Kansas City, Kansas. We hatch about 100 ducklings a month and start about 10 families on poultry. And so this is us at the Kansas City Farm School at Gibbs Road. We've been to over half of their public events and we're so, one of the highlights of the event. These kids gather around and play with the ducklings. We support local farmers markets. We help homesteaders produce better poultry. And we say best genetics to homesteaders because it's better meat and eggs. Next slide. So we support local merchants. There's three feed stores that are local, locally owned in the KCK area, and then two chains. So a lot of poultry feed customers. We give native plants to people. And we give about four farm tours a week on our property and show people what wetlands farming looks like, what um, gardening with plants and animals looks like. We have over 30 native plant varieties on site. And I don't eat mud myself, but ducks eat mud. They sit there and eat uh, out of the pond and filter water with their beaks. And so that's what wetlands farming looks like. This is our ducklings at LA Hardware Store. Next slide. So the way we help grain is two, the way we help the community is, is a two to one feed conversion ratio. So poultry makes protein a lot better than uh, beef or pigs. So I walk out with two quarts of grain every day and I come back with one quart of eggs. And so that two quarts of grain is 34 cents and one quart of eggs is worth $2. Next slide. So ducks have a lot of advantages over chickens. They are more disease resistant. They're more heat tolerant, more cold tolerant. They are better for gardening and they have cold manure, which is a big deal relative to composting because their manure is already composted as soon as it gets mixed with a normal amount of bedding. And ducks are quieter. So this is our little missionary work in the world is to help people get started on not just backyard poultry, but better backyard poultry. So next slide. 15 ducks would help our farm to have more income and be closer to self-sustaining. And it helps, like we said, 10 families a month to have more food security and more adult ducks means more hatching eggs. Next slide. KC Mo allows 15 ducks, also Gladstone and Independence and hundreds of family across the Metro have either 15 ducks or 15 chickens, 15 poultry. Next slide. So we had a, a pretty good go around with the Wyanoke County Conservation District. And um, when they said work with, I thought that that meant collaborate. 
However, it means obey. So we have now obeyed everything that Wanda County Conservation District meant. So this is a fence that covers the back, that keeps the ducks out of the back three areas. This is the back area of the pond. So the ducks stand on that dam right there and, and filter that water that comes down. This is the lowest part of the yard. Next slide. This is a dedicated composter they asked for. Next slide. Uh, they asked the front yard to be trimmed. This is what it looks like in summertime with a lot of plants. Next slide. This is what it looks like trimmed in fall after a lot of stuff has died back. Next slide. So they've asked for bare ground to be covered and seeded. So we have thrown down grass seed and this is straw or wood chips that's covering them. Next slide. So this, I saw you guys uh, wonder about this overgrowth. This is intentional growth. Much of what you see in this slide is now labeled for those who don't know how to identify plants, including the Wyandotte County Conservation District. So grape is most of what's there and it does produce grapes. We've had over 200 pounds of grapes harvested from the farm and it has a purpose. So. Remember, the city's own definition is of intentional growth. Does it have a purpose? So the roof protects ducks from sun. It helps them protect from hawks, and it produces food. So there's also sugar maple, hibiscus, Jerusalem artichoke, which is pretty big up front. Willow, sugar maple, already said that. Cut plant, elderberry. Next slide. Those are mostly native plants, apple, raspberry, pawpaw. Um, we're gonna get into the hatchlings. This is the cage where the hatchlings live. If you see, it's not much bigger than one cat. And we can put 90 ducklings in those two little rabbit hutches. And we, like we said, we hatch about a hundred a month. So we don't keep 90 for the whole month. We, we get them on out usually within the first week. Next slide. So again, hatchlings are small. This is Jacobina and Gramos who hatched out these own ducklings. There's about 10 in this picture. If you have a good eye, you can spot them. And that's the cherry bush in back. Next slide. And this is almost 100 ducklings in four shoe boxes. So hatchlings are pretty small. Next slide. So the city, um, Mr. Han just said there was formal complaints. I think we've had warning letters, but not official citations. Um, he could correct you if I'm wrong. Animal control has said ducks are well tended. We have now addressed our neighbor concerns. We had eight letters in support. I believe we have at least one person on the line in support. We had 38 people at the Planning Commission in support. Next slide. We did have some neighbors complaining. We have now talked to those neighbors and addressed their concerns with their main concern with smell and rodents. So they alleged that there's a smell and I have repeatedly maintained that there is no smell. And we've had four visits from city officials that noted no smell. So, um, you know, this is, this is an alleged, but anyway, a reduction in juveniles will address it. And the planning commission has already re reduced the juveniles down to 40. Um, and defining juveniles as three to eight weeks. So being clear with that. And neighbors have agreed with me to uh, discuss with me if they have any more problems. The foul permit requires that we have a rodent plan in place. So Mr. Lopez was there at the meeting when he heard some of these concerns. So we have now made nice with those neighbors and gave them some duck eggs and when the girls started laying this fall and they have gave back some sweet potato pie and some blueberry muffins. So we have done the, the neighborly thing and tried to make good on this. So next slide. So this brings you back to my request. I'm okay if you just say eight adult ducks and 40 duckling or 40 juveniles aged three to 16 weeks. But if you wanna say 12 or 15 adult ducks, 
I think there would be no problem with it and we'd be able to maintain concern in the planning I uh, did discuss with planning commission members, they said, you know, you can go backwards on this. You don't, you aren't stuck. You can actually just try this. So you can just try it for a while and see if it works. And I would say, just give me a chance on the 12 or 15. But if you don't feel generous, we can go with the eight with the redefinition but just don't go with what the planning commission said. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'll now open the public hearing. Kirk, have you received any notification of the public who wish to express their comments in favor of the item? No comments received. Is there anyone else present that'd like to speak in favor of the item? Clerk, is there anyone joining us virtually who'd like to speak in favor of the item? We have one hand raised, Susan Jaster. Ms. Jaster, you'll need to unmute. State your name and city for the record, please. Susan Jaster, Concordia, Missouri, Lincoln University, and um, I also work for Agribility of Missouri. And um, I think Karina has done a very good job of uh, taking care of her animals. And she has seen to uh, their health, but also the surrounding area of her property there, uh, trying to keep everything well, um, well trimmed. And uh, the only reason why some of the plants look large, I mean, she is looking at the use of these plants for the health and safety of her animals. So she's she has done a really good job of uh, protecting them with a little bit of cover. Um, hawks are uh, very talented at swooping in if you don't have anything in the way for them to have to maneuver around. So uh, she's just protecting her animals. And I think she has done a really good job with um, with her environment and uh, has shown some very unique ways to uh, keep the water runoff from happening. And also she has um, shown a lot of, uh, she's, I think she should be given a lot of credit for taking care of her composting and uh, all the this land around her home so that the animals are protected, plus they are not interfering with the comfort of neighbors. And um, I think that she does a very good job. I work for Lincoln University as an outreach person, as an extension person. And um, this is part of my job is to come and help her figure out ways to make more money, but also to keep her environment healthy for her livestock. And so um, I hope you'll pass it for her tonight. I think she's doing a great job and she will continue that. And I'm an advisor for her if, uh, if there's any time she needs help with something. Thank you. Clerk, is there anyone else virtually? No other hands are raised. Clerk, have you received any notification of the public who wish to express their comments in opposition to the item? No comments received. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in opposition to the item? Clerk, is there anyone joining us virtually like to speak in opposition to this item? No hands are raised. I will now close the public hearing. Uh, petitioner, would you like to make some closing remarks? Um, for my closing remark, can you put that slide back up so they know, <clears throat> let's get the wording right. And I would just ask to um, make sure that we change the 40 ducklings to 40 juveniles age three to 18 weeks, three to 16 weeks. And uh, up to you guys to introduce your motion on the number of adults. Thank you. That takes us to our commission comments and we have Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
to your to the best of your ability, can you explain what's the difference between eight adult ducks and fifteen adult ducks? How does that? What's the impact to the difference between those two amounts? The adults lay hatching eggs, so more hatching eggs means more ducklings, and then more ducklings means more uh, families that can get started on doing backyard poultry. Okay. So it, the big difference is your ability to do more is basically is the, the bottom line. Because more, more adult ducks is your ability to do more of the programming that you do. Correct. It's more farm income and more sustainability and more programming. Okay. Um, that is all I have for at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lopez. I love your idea. And I love what you're doing, honestly, I really do. Um, I strongly suggest, I've kind of been in your shoes before. Um, but I strongly suggest that you look for a piece of land to rent or lease. Um, that way you can grow because you're gonna outgrow, and you're really close if you're not already outgrowing your spot. Um, you're just in the wrong spot to, to, to grow more. But I think if uh, there, there's property, there's there's land that you can rent and lease, um, especially, and I think there's some in my district actually, but uh, that would be ideal for you to, there's, I think there's some uh, land to lease as well with, with ponds and whatnot. That's in the works. Right, right. But I understand what some of the neighbors that are not, their concerns is, yeah, I mean, it's going to bring in predators, hawks and stuff and owls. And I understand why you have the overgrowth. I get all that. But at the same time, it attracts owls, more owls, more hawks. And then their little dogs are big getting picked up. Their, little, their cats are being swooped up by the predatorial birds. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at with that. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Bynum is, is on deck. Thank you, Mayor. I have, I think, technical questions for uh, Mr. Hand. So the neighborhood where this is located is situated in the Jersey Creek, I wanna say basin or watershed. I'm not sure what the correct word is for that. Is that true? Senator Hand, Director Planer, resign. I do believe it's in a sub watershed, although the, as noted by the applicant, the property slopes to the south. So where this activity is happening in her backyard slopes towards State Avenue. Okay. Um, second question actually might need to be answered by the applicant. The waste that is produced by your ducks and ducklings i read the packet but can you just tell us again please how it is you keep that waste out of our water streams so the planning commission has asked for a vegetative buffer along the back edge of the property line and that is now in place uh, we showed that image and also they the planning commission has asked that we all waste is either composted on site or removed off site. So we have a lot of gardening customers that really will pay us 20 bucks a bag for uh, for manure. And okay. also because duck manure is a cold manure, it is composted almost immediately upon the addition of normal amounts of bedding. Okay, so you believe and 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 feel confident that it's not making its way into our our streams and rivers. Would that be true? I go out every day that it rains, especially when there's really heavy rain. I put on a really nice rain suit and boots, and I stand there and look at where the water goes. And I have not seen water leaving the property for over four years now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, last question, Mr. Hand. If we allow for the 
for example, up to 12, I would suggest. Um, and that becomes a two year term. I, I need to understand if this is Miss West's suggestion or you've actually reached a, a consensus with her to change it in this way. And if so, two things, is that a modification such that it would re require eight votes or would we just modify the special use permit and what would be the mechanism by which we would know if we needed to rescind it? What would be the reasons and the mechanism? On our hand, Dr. Planner Mazine, staff agrees with the City Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, we agree that to amend it to clarify 40 juveniles for ages 316 for the five year term, we defer to the Board of Commissioners wisdom on whether they want to increase that to 12 or 15. Our suggestion is if you do increase it to 12 or 15, we reduce it back to a two year term to see how things go. Both of these amendments would require a majority, super majority to change the recommendation. Okay. Okay, they're substantially changed enough that they would need the, the eight votes. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. And to rescind, sorry to answer your final question, Commissioner, um, to rescind a special use permit, we would probably potentially in the future hypothetically start receiving some complaints and then we would go through the proceedings to rescind it with the Board of Commissioners. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Ms. West, glad that you were able to kind of explain um, kind of your passion project and everything that you've worked on. I know we've discussed and I've been to your property and I've kind of seen this uh, with my own eyes. I do have kind of a technical question because I don't know a lot about ducks. Um, what is the difference between a duckling and a juvenile? That's why we defined it as three to 16 weeks. Okay, so for your purpose, okay, so you're kind of that definition that we have for ducklings, I guess for staff, is there any, do we have a definition when we say 40 ducklings? As I understand, got our hand, Director Planner would design, again, the original application uh, at the City Planning Commission, we were talking about in the terms or vernacular of ducklings. For staff, our understanding was that would be baby ducks before they start breeding. The applicant then came back and clarified that a duckling is like the baby. A juvenile gets us the juvenile. And so three to 16 is right before they start producing. I see. I see. So okay. she, she, again, make no mistake, this is a, this is a business. Um, and at, she tries to, as I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. West, but she tries to sell them between three and 16 weeks. To other farms to establish other duckling farms and once they get past 16 they potentially start producing eggs and that's when they become full of full full-blown ducks and that's where we start hitting the 8 12 15 whatever gotcha so there has to be kind of this process in which yeah. some of those um ducks are miss west helped us better understand the time frame gotcha of when to um sell them or or give them away okay thank you mayor thank you commissioner commissioner kane thank you mayor I don't know anything about ducks, but says no one can argue about baby ducklings being irresistible. Unfortunately for ducklings, their care becomes more and more difficult for most people as they grow older. Ducklings are fully grown in 30 days. So we're going to say she can have eight ducks, and if she has 40 of them, she's going to have 48 adults in short order. And, and th this is you know, I got it on my phone, you know, and, and as Commissioner Lopez says, you know, I'm not real sure I want, would want that next to my house, you know, because you don't know what kind of other things that you're inviting to be over at the house. I, I, I'm struggling with this. I struggled with, with, with this the first time, but this is very important that, that they are full grown at about 30 days. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
good evening to the applicant and Mr. Hand, and I too will need a bit of clarification. What currently, Mr. Hand, is the applicant under in terms of what's allowed? Under director plan and resign, the current um, approval is for eight ducks. And that's it? Correct. I, I no disagree. Ducklings. Well, let me let me let him finish. It, it, that's all. What, or what, what was it? Two years ago, that this was initially presented. Correct. And it was just eight. Okay. The current approval was for eight ducks you, plus all the babies. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to interrupt you. You can't unless you're asked a question by the commissioner. Your your time has expired to give your presentation. So if she wants to ask you a question directly, then then you can speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and the current planning commission recommendation is eight ducks plus these 40 ducks. Is that correct, Mr. Han? Yeah, to Ms. West Point, I think there was an understanding that there would be ducks breeding and cycling out throughout the process. The letter of the condition, the letter of the approval is eight ducks. Okay. Thank previously, you. currently. Okay. Uh, also in the homework packet, there were notes that there had not been uh, previous recommendations by the Wyandotte County Conservation District as to how the property was to be kept or maintained. What's the current status with regard to that? Gunnar Hand, Director Plan and Design. <clears throat> um, Conservation District uh, worked with staff um, they're a little short staffed and they did not want to go back on to Miss West property. So we went on there with for her, provided the comments uh, for her being the conservation district uh, lead. Um, and they reviewed our notes, uh, feedback, and debriefed with us before um, issuing their final comments. And what was the outcome of that? Was there compliance or what we're reading is? the current situation that all, all of the issues that were raised in our conversations with the conservation district were the slides that Ms. West specifically noted in her presentation about um, ground cover, uh, about the vegetated buffer, about the compost bin. Uh, those were all originally conservation district comments that were requested as per the renewal. Okay. She was demonstrating that she was meeting the conservation district's comments. Okay. Huh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Last comment with regard to the conservation district, though, is, is what concerns me. It says that uh, the district does not believe that the current setup can accommodate, can support more than the currently allotted amount of ducks, which is eight. And that's what's hard for me to get over. And it goes to comments by uh, uh, Commissioner Lopez. Uh, we're, we're in an urban environment and we have to have some type of measurement by which we try to accommodate uh, the applicants, but are also aware of the environment that these ducks, the chickens, the goats, you know, are in. And uh, that's what gives me pause here as to what the conservation district has determined in the property. I applaud you for uh, coming up to the other standards and what you've done, but it just seems here like the amount of property that you're operating on would be limited to eight, I guess, with these other ducklings that come along, you have to sell them, get rid of them. So that's the concern that I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. Um, I didn't know that tonight that we were going to get quite an education in um, the process of duck raising and, and selling of eggs. So that kind of quacks me up. Um, <laughs> well, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> we need to smile a little bit, right? Um, Ma'am, I have a question for you. Um, so when you talked about the getting rid of the manure, right, and you said that you you sell it or you compost it right now, so do you currently have customers that you're selling excess manure to? Correct. You do. Okay. So that I was going back to kind of like what Commissioner Bynum was 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 talking about. So ducks or ducklings or 
little ones or juveniles or whatever that don't get sold, right? Before they reach the 16 weeks, what do you do with them? What happens to them then? Because according to some documentation and Commissioner Kane pointed it out that um, a, a, a duck is full grown in 30 days. I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea. But um, when do they start laying eggs? At what age? And what do you do with um, the ducks if they're not sold? So my uh, current business model is that I get rid of almost all of them immediately before three weeks old. And that's why we're asking for the hatchlings, the young little babies are not included in the limit because under three weeks old, they're quite small. And we showed a lot of pictures to show you how small they are. So the three to 16 weeks is not, um, those are not really revenue generating. So I don't really like to keep very many of them. Uh, 40 is the max that I would like to keep. These numbers can be uh, changed before you guys vote on them. And it could be three to eight weeks. It could be 20 juveniles, whatever um, the magic number. But they do start laying eggs at 16 weeks, which is better than chickens, which is at 20 weeks. Better because you can... Yeah, because it's 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 almost two to four weeks sooner than a chicken will start laying. But what you're saying when they reach laying age, you're planning on them being gone. No, correct. I'm planning on because I'm only wanting to keep the eight adults. So the juveniles are what you call a grow out. So if you're in a breeding situation, Basically what I do is I, I hatch a hundred a month. I sell 80 of them and then I keep the 20 best next month. Same thing. I sell 80 of them. I keep the 20 best. And then by eight weeks, they're grown up. I can assess them at an eight week old age. And then I know which are the best to keep for the next round of breeding. Just listening to your numbers, it sounds like that we're actually talking about there being on site a lot more than just eight adults and 40 babies i mean that's what it sounds like to me when you when you just put that out there like that are you saying and i think this is what you said in the very beginning that you were amenable to the planning's recommendation at eight because i think that's what you said when you first got up but if we feel generous i think is what you said that we would be at 12 or 15. yeah i'm amenable to the eight adult ducks but 40 ducklings you can't run a hatchery without hatchlings so i need the hatchlings that are under three weeks old so i need to change that 40 duckling to to exclude those hatchlings that are under three weeks old so that's why it says juveniles age three to 16 weeks it could be three to eight weeks if or if uh, Mr. Kane says they're full grown at 30 days, it could I be three to four. Well, they're, they're, right here. they're full grown at eight weeks. That's the butcher age. So for males, that's another reason ducks are better than chickens. So planning staff recommends the eight adult ducks plus 40 ducklings, correct? That's what staff is that what is that what the planning and zoning was recommending and got approval. Gunnar Hendricks planning and zoning. The recommendation from the planning commission is eight ducks, forty ducklings, or as I understand from tonight's testimony, hatchlings. Based on what she said this evening, it sounds like we have eight ducks, approximately a hundred hatchlings, and those grow into or are reduced down to up to forty juveniles which she then chooses to breed the next round okay i i make a motion mayor to support the recommendation by planning and zoning okay uh there is a motion i'll pause on it, that acceptance prior to uh, dr hill as a question thank you mayor just one quick question for mr hand um again i'm just not knowledgeable at all but uh, I do have a quick question. Is there a possibility for underground swelling of water going into the uh, watershed to the uh, Jersey Creek? I'm just, I think you mentioned it earlier, but I just need clarity. Thank you. 
Gunner Head Director Planner resign. So if the water is infiltrating on her property, the earth is cleaning it before it reaches the water table. So that's not the issue. If anything is flowing off of the property, which is why we've been pretty focused on the um, vegetative barrier around the periphery, that water would eventually end up in our storm sewer system, which would eventually end up in uh, in this location. I do believe it goes through Jersey Creek and then out to the Missouri River. So we are trying to keep and maintain and uh, filter it on site as best as possible. And so is the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. I had a quick question. Uh, Ms. Tran, if you can pull the slide up with the, the, the front of the, the petitioner's house. And I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, is this her presentation? You think that yes. picture is that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, I believe it's that fall. Yeah, those. Um, I guess a question for clarity, and you know, I'm not I'd have to try to picture where that neighborhood is at. I have a good idea, but just that house. It's the West Side Minor Historic District. Oh, West Side. Okay. Yeah. Does does that house and that vegetation conform with the with the aesthetics of the surrounding neighborhood? And um if and then are there any code violations? that would be come into question with um, that overgrowth that I know it, some people call it natural vegetation. Some people call it weeds. I don't know, it just depends on the interpretation and what the, the official, you know, uh, justification would be as far as that terminology. And I don't know. So those are two kind of two questions. Uh, Gunnar and Director Planner resigned. So property maintenance compliance um, was sent to the property before she trimmed it back. And at issue was not the types of plants that were there. It was the state of them. So she then went and cut them back as requested. And then what about the conformity with the, the, the surrounding neighborhood? Um, I don't remember any neighbors. She, neighbors she, I that, believe she's the only urban homestead basically in West Side Manor that I've seen to this degree for sure. So would it be safe to say that that aesthetic appearance does doesn't fit with the surrounding aesthetics of the of, of her neighbors. Um, got her answer to plain air design. Uh, I think the fact that she chooses not to have uh, non-native grass instead, and and these native plants is. Uh, not addressed in our code. It is the maintenance of those plants that is addressed in our code as it relates to property maintenance. It is unique. I think that all of our planning activities in the last four years that I've been here have been supportive of urban farming and urban gardening and vertical uh, businesses like Mrs. Miss West's. So while this is a standout in this historic neighborhood, uh, I don't think that it's, uh, I mean, you can look back to the West Side Manor originally when all of those folks were doing their own victory gardens. This is no different. It just hasn't been done in a while. I, I guess I struggle. You know, I, I patrolled a lot of those neighborhoods. I, I don't ever recall, and I get it. You're saying you support that type of aesthetics, but you know, um, I, I struggle to find very many neighborhoods with overgrowth like that that conforms to the surrounding. Uh, neighborhoods, you know, especially if I get true lawn to come out and mow my lawn. Right. And next door to me um, is this natural stated vegetation to support a duck farm. Um, so I just was, I, the majority, I guess, to clarify my question, is this the only house in that neighborhood that has this type of aesthetical appearance, outward appearance? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there was a motion on the, the floor. Could you repeat that motion, uh, Commissioner Stites? I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Before you do that, okay, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mary. Sorry, Commissioner. Have we heard from anyone that may have had a voice in opposition? I just kind of lost track. We did already, or have we called for that? One lady spoke in favor. And that's what I'm saying. Have we 
Uh, uh, clerk, for the record, uh, the commissioner uh, wants a, uh, just a note of inquiry as to were there any, um, any notes of opposition online are um, present um, or that you received in opposition of this item? No comments were received and no hands were raised online. I mean, anybody here have I just kind of lost track where we are? No, the, the clerk uh, made note. Right. There, were, there was no opposition. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, mine is clarification to uh, Commissioner Seitz's motion. So your motion is to approve plannings Planning, uh, Planning Commission's recommendation of eight adult ducks and 40 ducklings. Is that correct? Correct. So not the change to juveniles? No. Okay. I just wanted a clarification on the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Commissioner Stites to repeat his motion um, for the record. I make a motion to support planning and zoning's recommendation with eight uh, adult ducks and 40 ducklings. I, I second that one. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? No. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? No. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to our next item, which is C1. Clerk, could you please read that in its entirety? Plan review application, item PR 2023-028, Jacob Dobbs with Call Valley Engineering, final development plan for a change in occupancy to convert a vacant retail shop into a laundromat at 1720 Minnesota Avenue, recommended for approval by a vote of six to two. All right, um, I'll ask the applicant uh, to come to the podium, present, and state your name and address, and present your uh, your proposal. Clerk, I believe you have some people online who would like to speak first. Are are they the petitioner? Are the applicant? Correct. They are. Okay, clerk. We have Matt Cross with Call Valley Engineering. Yeah, this is Matt Cross with Call Valley Engineering, uh, 8040 North Oak Traffic Way, Kansas City, Missouri. I do believe that uh, Kathy Warman, the project architect, uh, will speak on behalf of the project, and she should also be online. We have Warman Architecture online. Yes, that's correct. Hi, this is Kathy Warman. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Matt, did you want me to start? Yes, please. Go ahead. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kathleen Warman with Warman Architects. I am here representing the owner along with um, Matt Cross with Caw Valley Engineering. Um, we are proposing the raise and rebuild um, at the location at 1720 Minnesota Avenue of the existing buildings that are there um, and replacing that with a 5,400 square foot new building um, to be used as a coin operated laundry. I believe in the audience live is uh, our Tom Lawson and Summer Lawson, uh, the owners um, and developers of the property. Uh, we did get uh, approval from the plan commission for this project, and we appreciate that and, and uh, would uh, are here to answer any questions that you have uh, about the project. Thank you. I'll now open the public hearing. Clerk, have you received any notifications uh, from the public who wish to express their comments in favor of the item? No comments were received. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in favor of this item? Okay. Um, is there anyone joining us virtually, clerk, that would like to speak in favor of the item? No hands are raised. Clerk, have you received any notifications from the public who, who wish to express their comments in opposition to the item? No comments received. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in opposition to this item? 
Clerk, is anyone joining us virtually like to speak in opposition to this item? No hands are raised. I'll close the public hearing. Uh, I'll ask the uh, petitioner to make some closing remarks. May I, as ownership, speak on some closing remarks? If uh, so, allowed by the applicant. I mean, it's up to the applicant. Yes, please uh, allow uh, the Lawsons to speak on behalf of the project. Hi, my name is Summer Lawson. My address is Fairway, Kansas, and I'm just high level hitting this item. This item does go against the current master plan for city downtown um, because the master plan requires the building to be up to the corner. I do want to acknowledge that and there has been other reasons that we haven't brought this building up to the corner, those being sewer um, connections with the city and mostly safety and security and functionality of our um, facilities with a laundry mat with dryer venting. And that is my comments and I will happily answer any questions along with the architect and um, engineers with you guys. So thank you. Thank you all open questions up to the commission. Commissioner Burns. Yes, that property is in that district and I and I know exactly where you're at and I think it'd be a huge improvement for that area consider what is there now. And I commend you for coming forward and trying to make that happen. And like Commissioner uh, Stites, uh, you can't assure us that there won't be any money laundering down there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner Davis. Um, I just want to make sure I remember because I did watch the uh, planning commission meeting last month, all four hours and I think it was 37 minutes of it. So let me try to recall, and Mr. Hand, I'll need, need to help uh, or need to help me out. The planning commission's recommendation to us is to amend what the current uh, master plan is so that the developers and what they're wanting to do is allowed. Is that correct? Gunnar Hand, Director of Planner Design. If I could give my comments, this is a final development plan for a laundromat. This was requested as per ordinance by three commissioners, Commissioner Stites, former Commissioner McKiernan, and former Commissioner Markley. Typically, final development plans do not come to the Board of Commissioners. Um, that is why this unique situation is happening today. Um, this was held over at the City Planning Commission for a month for redesign, which did not occur, which is the hearing that you then heard subsequently at our last meeting. This is in the downtown area plan. There was no support, no opposition. There's some older notices of violation on the property that would be addressed through the redevelopment. Planning Commission recommends approval. Staff disagrees with Planning Commission's recommendation. What you're here to do is to approve the final development plan and that's it. Okay, and that final plan is unchanged, which is satisfactory to what the developers want, but it goes against our current adopted plan. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. Okay, I would move to approve. Um, I guess I, thank you. There's a motion and a second for approval. Before we accept those motions, I, I believe Commissioner Davis was specific in the question, Mr. Hand, as to does that development go against the master plan? And you said essentially, uh, is that a yes or a no, or maybe so? This project does not comply with neither the commercial design guidelines or the um, downtown area master plans design guidelines. Um, that is the work that staff was trying to do with the applicant. They did make quite a few adjustments in terms of materiality and the design of the actual building. It essentially did come down to the siting of the property at which the applicant described why they couldn't or didn't want to move into the corner of the lot. Um, this is the gateway to downtown, our most urban, dense, walkable neighborhood. And this is an automobile oriented development. That's staff's opinion, but again, 
we, I believe the city planning commission to your specific question, commissioner Davis, city planning commission provided the deviations necessary um, from both of those design guidelines. So the only thing being considered today is the final development plan as, as presented in the packet. Just, just follow my question. These master plans, are these definitive as, as it relates to ordinances and resolutions passed by the commission as, as to what can or cannot go when you talk about uh, the planning and zoning ordinances as far as is that concerned? Because there's a lot of plans out there, master plans. I mean, there's a lot of areas. Um, the, I've been hearing plans all my career here. And so they're a plan, but but how does that, how does that plan, how does it codify whether or not um, when these are brought forward to either approve or disapprove a project based on a plan? So all area plans, all long range plans for that matter, um, as per state statute are adopted by ordinance, therefore they are the policy of the governing body who adopts them and everything that's included within them. Um, the way that, this, that the unified government has handled design guidelines, not every area plan has design guidelines. The Prairie Del the Piper area plan has design guidelines. The downtown area plan has their own design guidelines. Rosedale has their own design guidelines. The Northeast area plan mentions that in certain areas, in certain land use categories, excuse me, um, any new development in those land uses are to follow the narrow lot design guidelines. The issue there is you have a bunch of design guidelines all over the place and to implement them is to take the action as developments come forward and follow them. It is the city planning commission's uh, prerogative to deviate from any of those design guidelines moving forward after the adoption of the comprehensive plan update the direction is to consolidate and make those design guidelines comprehensive and put them into the zoning ordinance so any deviation from them is a variance by the board of zoning appeals not some deviation by the city planning commission many of our design guidelines especially when it comes to materiality are way out of date simply because they make a new building material every day um, and some of these are a decade old and so um, part of the zoning code update will be that comprehensive consolidation of design guidelines to pull them out of the area plans where really they don't unless i talk about them they don't you know, nothing really happens, right? So, um, so we're we're trying to fix that. That's another structural issue with planning the way we did do it, and the way, in my education expertise, believes would be the best practice to do it. And that's where I was going with my question is because I've seen plans, and I've seen developments throughout various parts of that didn't conform to the master plans for that area, and they didn't get the type of pushback, and they were allowed to go through. Uh, and they weren't in compliance with any of the plans that were in place. Um, and there's, there's several, if you go back for years, examples of that. Sure. So I'm, I just, I'm curious as to at this moment and who decides and who makes that discretionary decision outside of this commission um, to say, well, you can move this project forward, but because it doesn't conform to whatever plan that may be out there, old or whatever, and then, oh, we're going to, not recognize the plan because it's just a plan it's just a guide we use but it's not codified in actual our planning and zoning ordinances like you just mentioned and i know you just said you want to fix that which is great um but I, I guess i'm kind of lost as to whose discretion is it to make that decision in the in this interim period in the last four years we've been trying to provide as much consistency about how we speak about, apply, review, and make recommendations as it relates to design guidelines. Um, things still slip through the cracks, as you noted, even in the last four years, the discretion is the city planning commissions to deviate from it. Ultimately, it's the board of commissioners decision, namely because you all are the adopters of the long range plans. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Mayor. The, I, I just want to state that the district presently has what I would consider some challenging spots. 
this, I'm sure the clients have done a demographic or need study. They wouldn't just plop down and throw a, a laundry mat in the middle of a community if there was no need. So I, I do appreciate the fact that they're using a more modern building, which will be utilizing our utilities more than what the present building is. It's a more modern building. The agriculture that we spent dealing with ducks, if you'll notice the agriculture trees that are being stationed around the building will add a little bit of urban renewal to, a, I don't want to say a challenged area, but if you go just a half a block west, you come into a car wash and a building that should have been tore down probably a number of years ago. So I, I want to thank you for your interest in our community. I'm going to be supportive of your of the motion. I think it's long overdue to see that building removed and a new facility, a more modern facility, and hopefully it'll be a catalyst for the rest of the quarter. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Davis. I'll say very, very quickly, I know you all were in the crowd while uh, USD 500 was talking about um, the kindergarten readiness program and stuff. So we'd love for you all to get connected and to see that in your development as it comes to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stites. Commissioner Stites, District 7. So I wanted to, a little bit of clarification as to what uh, uh, Mr. Hand had uh, spoke about the signing on of uh, myself, um, uh, Commissioner Markley and Commissioner uh, McKiernan two or who are no longer with us. So it, it, it appeared to me, it seemed wrong that something that could greatly impact our downtown, that if the planning and zoning would happen to um, vote no on this, that it, we would never get a chance to hear it, right? And I think that it goes back to like what, uh, what uh, Gunnar's saying, that we, we need to probably look at how that process, you know, so at the end of the day, we ultimately, not to take away from planning and zoning and, and, and their good work that they do, right? But at the end of the day, if we feel like that we, we are the elected, they are the appointed, and I'm not taking anything away from them because they do a good job, but I think at the end of the day, it should fall squarely on our shoulders as the elected as to what um, should, should happen, uh, at least a, a, a decision, a final decision should be made. And then, so, one thing, and I'd like to ask uh, legal about, so I reached out to one of the other than my own um, planning uh, and zoning appointee uh, to discuss this, not to say which way to vote or not vote, just to discuss it. And I wanna ask um, a legal if it is appropriate for me to vote on this since I did reach out and spoke to that, speak to that person. Um, if or if I should be uh, if I should recuse myself on this vote. So was the conversation before or after they decided? Before. Before. And are you able to make the decision based on what you've heard this evening? Because you're you are um, serving in a quasi judicial function. Are you able to make it? the decision this evening based on what you learned this evening or what you've learned outside it could because if you if it takes into account too much of you know I mean obviously you have common sense and knowledge that you can employ um, but you have to I've been supportive of this project since I learned about it so I think what I'm going to do to be safe is I'm going to refuse myself on I this I think vote. that is the safest right. thank you Thank you. Uh, before we get into the motions, Mr. Ann, can you go back to the pictures of the actual site? I think, I don't think we, yes. For those of you who don't know, uh, that building sits at 18th in Minnesota at predominantly, I mean, it's just right there on the, the north uh, east corner uh, at that intersection uh, next to a gas station. And, and I totally support uh, what you all are doing, um, the applicants. Uh, um, I've talked a lot about investing in the disinvested parts of our town, and this is one of those disinvested parts um, that could be a seed to further economic development, again, to provide the types of good services, resources, and amenities. And I'm sure, and I think one of the commissioners brought that up, I'm not sure who, I just remember one of them said it, um, that um, the residents in that neighborhood not only need, but they deserve. 
um, uh, and it will bring a beautified uh, uh, facility um, that is, I know is gonna be utilized by the residents at that location that to me says blight. So I just wanna say thank you. And uh, to hit on Commissioner uh, Stites's uh, question, um, I, I champion um, working with this commission to uh, work with my staff uh, and our legal team and our administrator uh, to look at policies that may not reflect um, both um, the values, the, the will of this commission and the expectations of our communities to bring them in alignment of where we're at today in 2024. And we can do that as a commission and, and I'm willing to work with all of you to do that. So if there are nuances that and frustrations that we gather from our constituents um, and nuances in policies, that really is our overriding role is to get policies that hopefully um, can come to this commission and at a commission meeting, um, a decision that can be made that can better uh, align with where um, our constituents want us to be and where this commission um, feels uh, we should be to move things along in a way that cuts out the bureaucracy and, and some of the, uh, the nuances that really uh, hamper getting quality developments um, from getting done in our community. And so uh, there was a motion, I believe Commissioner Davis had a motion. You wanna, for clarity, Commissioner, uh, repeat your motion. Yeah, it would just be to approve uh, what the Planning Commission has submitted for recommendation. There is a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call, Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to our next item. Clerk, could you read that in its entirety? That's fine. Clerk. The next two items are related. First one is a plan review application PR 2023-034. Curtis Peterson with Polsonelli, a preliminary plan review to construct a multifamily development at 1300 North 59th Street recommended for approval by a seven to one vote and also a master plan application for medium density residential to high density residential at 1300 North 59th Street recommended for approval with a seven to one vote. Each of these items will require a vote. Thank you. I'll ask Mr. Hand to make some remarks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Gunner Hand, Director of Planning and Resign. Again, as the clerk noted, this case is being heard in conjunction with Master Plan Amendment 2023-017. This case was also, this project was also heard by the Board of Zoning Appeals uh, 2023-051 for a parking variance, which was granted last month. This is a 180, proposed 180 unit apartment complex. It's in the citywide comprehensive plan area in the Midtown neighborhood, no support. There has been opposition to the project. There are no notices of violation on the property. Staff agrees with Planning Commission recommends uh, approval with conditions, including following the multifamily design guidelines. <clears throat> Sidewalk connections to State uh, Avenue, which is two parcels to the south, and a final development plan will be required by this app, uh, by this project in the future. Thank you. Um, give me a second. I'll let the petitioner make some opening comments. Thank you, Mayor. Kirk Peterson here on behalf of the applicant, 900 West 48th Place, Kansas City, Missouri. The I also have an, the, the applicant is, uh, technically me, but the developer is called Marion Development. And I actually have uh, Shelby Miles that's with me that flew in to be here to represent from the company. A quick note on Marion, I like to do this when we have a very big capital investment that's coming into town. I like to say a little bit about who, who it is because we haven't, haven't seen Marion before in KCK or in the Kansas City area. They're based in Kentucky. They've been around about 22 years. 
they specialize in all different types of uh, residential. So everything they do is residential, but a lot of different types, uh, really all over the country. They're up to about a half a billion dollars right now of investment that they've done so far. They, like I said, this is their first time in the Kansas City area. I'm really glad a uh, little bit of YADC hat on here. I'm glad they chose to come to KCK first. And uh, we're thrilled that they're uh, proposing to make a, approximately a $45 million investment just north of State Avenue. We can go to that first slide there. Thank you, Gunnar. So you can get the location on the screen. You saw it in your packet, but I always think it's good to remember exactly where we are when we're proposing a project. This is about nine acres, that rectangle that's shaded, hashed on the screen there. It's bounded by 59th Street, which is that east boundary that runs up from State Avenue. You have some industrial sort of commercial uses immediately south that is between State Avenue and the site. You have a mobile home park, which is, uh, you can kind of see it there, all that detail south of the trees, just to the west of the project and southwest. And then you have some single family there to the north of the property. The access for this is two different spots on 59th Street. Next slide, please, Gunnar. As, as Mr. Hand said, this is, a, and I, this is a pet peeve of mine. North is to the right. I think they were having trouble fitting on the screen, so don't get disoriented there. 59th Street is running north, south, State Avenue is to your, to your left on the screen. So this is a six building multifamily project. You can see those on the screen. They're three stories in height, except when it falls down the hill. You see the shaded part on the south side. That's when it's falling down the hill. So kind of like your walkout basement, right? It presents itself as four story, but they're fundamentally three story buildings. They have pitched roofs, just like residential homes, 180 units. There's a number of amenities that are provided for this community, including a clubhouse, an outdoor gathering space, a playground, bike racks, active open spaces, et cetera. I always like to speak to the architecture, even though this is just a preliminary development plan. This is, as they always do at Marion, they build these to last. They own and operate all their buildings. They, they stay around and uh, they care that these buildings last a long time. So this is primarily masonry, brick, and also cementious, uh, fiber cementious siding. Now, a quick note, and I slow down and pause on this because it's extremely important. A quick note on the target community, the demographics for this project that I would submit to you and will prove up to you in a moment is perfectly situated here. This is a low-income housing tax credit project. When I say that, I don't care if I'm in Wyandotte County, Johnson County, Jackson County, Douglas County, doesn't matter where I am. When I bring a really good, really expensive, really impressive project, really impressive developer in, there's at least a portion of the folks at the dais that go, oh, low-income housing tax credits, right? That's natural. I'm saying, I'm just calling it out right now. It's a natural thing. But those are inaccurate notions, at least today. Maybe dec decades ago, it was different. This is something that I don't think is just, oh man, okay. This is exciting. As somebody that sees lots of projects in Wyandotte County and sits on the board at YEDC, this is what we're talking about, man. Providing attainable housing for people that work in our community. This is not sort of your, your grandmother's, you know, low income project that people are afraid of. And here's what I mean. This is an expensive, just as expensive as a market rate project, $45 million investment. This is extraordinarily nice. What makes it attainable is that the federal government has provided a program that says, if you do this, and if you make sure that people can afford the rents here, then I'm going to give you some tax credits that overall make it less expensive to build the project, right? But then you say, fine, you've proven to me that this is really nice. This is a really nice project that's going to look great and last for a long time. That's a fact. But attainable for who? Who's going to live here? People without jobs? Nope. Not a project like this. That's not, that's not what a low-income housing tax project like this is all about. In fact, we're talking most of the rents between on this particular project and the $800 to $1,600 a month. That's a lot of money. You, you got to have a job to afford that. This is a quality community that targets a specific demographic. What's the demographic? Police officers, teachers, UG employers, nurses. I could go on and on. And in fact, I said a minute ago, it was really well situated, a great spot along State Avenue. I was running kind of some, some concentric circles on distances, extraordinarily close to where? Providence Hospital, the Junior College, Village West, Amazon, 
urban outfitters. I have more, I could keep going, right? It's really well situated. And we talk again, I invoke YDC because we, I'm looking at a few of you. We spend a lot of time listening and debating issues there, which I think is incredibly important. And we talk about what one of the major issues at the annual planning meeting the last few years has been. We have all these pretty good wages in Wyandotte County. You look at the charts, wages are pretty good. But then we find out that a lot, a lot of people, they don't live in Wyandotte County. Why? Because we don't have quality housing that people can afford. Quality housing that people can afford. So I'm just taking a quick moment. I know we're just doing a PDP tonight um, and a master plan amendment. But there's context here to what we're doing. And I know I'm fighting against all the human nature on conjuring up what this project is. But I'm telling you, if that's where your brain was going, I don't blame you. It's not what this project is. This is a high quality project for targeted, important employees that work in Wyandotte County at the employers that we care a lot about that we want to live here too, not just work here. I'd also say this as somebody that spent a lot of time on the Indian Springs property. Some of you were here. I mean, we spent a we're trying, still trying to figure that out, right? And I really got schooled a lot on that side of State Avenue, the east side, not just Village West, but over on the east side as you get to 635. And there's a lot of good people that live in those neighborhoods. But I also know that there was kind of unanimous support that there's a lot of investment that needs to happen over there. This isn't all the way to 635. But this is, this is that area of influence that we were talking about when we went through that planning process. And I'll just say, this is a $45 million investment next to, remember the context, which is good, off State Avenue. I see this as a primer. We talk about going east with investment. I know the mayor's a big leader in that. Huge, very outspoken. This is definitely the east side and working its way farther east. I think this could be a real ripple, cause a ripple, You know, $45 million. So with that, we support all the conditions of approval that Mr. S Mr. Han and his staff have proposed. Um, we would respectfully request tonight that you would support both. There's two items, the PDP and also the master plan amendment that con conforms with that. And I'd be happy, Mayor, to answer your questions or the, com or the commissions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Um, I know up in the public hearing, Clerk, have you received any notifications <laughs> from the public who wish to express their comments in favor of the item? No comments received. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in favor of the item? Clerk, is anyone joining us virtually who'd like to speak in favor of the item? We have Greg, Greg Kendall online. Mr. Kendall. Good evening. Uh, this is Greg Kendall, president of the Wyandotte Economic Development Council. I apologize I'm not there this evening. I know I haven't had a chance to meet all of the new commissioners just yet. This is a proposal that um, I suspect EDNF will be reviewing here shortly as well. I just wanted to weigh in briefly. Curtis did a nice job of giving a good overview of this project. But over the last two years, what we have heard is that we need more affordable, attainable housing in Wyandotte County, particularly on the east side. It's taken us almost two years to begin lining up developers who are interested in that. And we appreciate the fact that we've had a lot of guidance from the mayor and, and from the mayor's team to make that happen. And so tonight, you're starting to see those projects roll forward. And as Curtis noted, this is a developer that's looking at a $45 million project. Today, that 8.9 acres generates about $1,300 a year in property taxes. This project will generate far more, as you might expect. We're in the discussions about what that might look like, but it's significantly more than $1,300, and it provides housing that's affordable for our residents. So I just wanted to weigh in briefly. I, I'm not into a full um, dissertation this evening. I'll wait for another evening, but I did want to weigh in and let you know that that this is a quality project with a playground and picnic areas and amenities that you would expect to find in a development on the west side of the community as well. So thank you. Is there anyone else, Clerk? No other hands are raised. Clerk, have you uh, received any notification from people who wish to express their comments in opposition to the item? Is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of the item? Okay, seeing none. Clerk, have you received any notification from the public who would like to express their comments in opposition? Yes, the clerk's office received three comments. I will read the summary of those comments. The first one is from Valerie Webb. 
Kansas City, Kansas. I'm writing to you in opposition to the Marion Development Group's project to build an apartment complex in my neighborhood and community on 59th Street. The following statements are not in order of importance, but simply my observation. As far as I can tell, the Marion Development Group does not have any other projects in Kansas City, Kansas, nor are they working in conjunction with any housing organizations in Kansas City. At the neighborhood meeting that was held November 17th, someone from either the law firm or the developer referenced finding a piece of dirt that meets the need for low-income housing in Wyandotte County. The dirt referenced is eight plus acres of woodlands that wildlife has that has been dispersed from the various previous low to mid income housing projects located within one mile radius over the past 15 years. The street on which the development is proposed has a rural ambiance with only five single family homes adjacent to the property. Those five homes collectively sit on approximately 14 acres. The street itself was once a rural road that spans a mere 18 feet wide of asphalt with no adjoining sidewalks or no yellow, no passing signage. There are various housing options within the area for residents that range from low to mixed income to market value. They offer options for the community with more amenities and safer neighborhoods. Building a complex that will include 182 units of one, two and three bedrooms will certainly increase both vehicular and pedestrian traffic on 59th Street. The proposed crosswalk and sidewalk to connect sends a strong message and not one that KCK should be proud of. The complex has made accommodations for individuals with disabilities within the complex, yet once they step outside of that accessible safe environment, it is travel at your own risk. Vehicles frequently travel faster than the posted 30 miles an hour. Individuals with disabilities can live independently in environments that accommodate their needs. An individual who's visually impaired who tries to use a crosswalk that has no signals to slow or stop oncoming traffic puts that person at risk. The same goes for someone who is hearing impaired as they start to cross when no traffic is initially seen. Someone who has physical limitations will need to find alternate means of travel. The building of the complex could, that could have a range of 356 to 1500 residents will have an impact on the neighborhood. The most recent developments at Eileen's Place, Buchanan's Crossing, et cetera, are in an area that offers more amenities, including a grocery store, gas station, restaurant, various retailers, pharmacies, auto services, I am sure the complex will be nice and understand there is a need for low income housing in Wyandotte County, but it does not fit this neighborhood community that consists of people who are long term residents on a rural asphalted road. My suggestion would be to find existing vacant land in proximity to more amenities designed for pedestrian and vehicular traffic without needing to remove any trees. There is no denying there are a variety of vacant lots throughout Kansas City, Kansas that might prove to be a better building site for a multifamily complex of this side. Plan KCK supports the use of current vacant properties to improve neighborhoods. Respectfully, Valerie Webb. Second comment is from Betsby Rivas Garcia. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the importance of development for the growth of our community. However, the scale and nature, nature of this proposed project raise significant questions and considerations that I believe warrant careful examination. Our concerns primarily revolve around the following points, infrastructure and traffic impact. We are extremely worried about the potential strain on our existing infrastructure, such as roads, sewer systems, and utilities. Traffic safety, the increased foot traffic coupled with the lack of sidewalks may lead to unsafe conditions for both pedestrians and drivers. We are concerned about the potential for accidents and the overall impact on the well-being of our community members. North 59th Street is a rural road that does not have sidewalks and is only 18 feet wide. Currently, if two large vehicles such as waste disposal, school bus delivery truck, BPU or fire truck are using the two-way street, they have to be very mindful to the limited space. If a third vehicle needs to use the street, then it has to either wait behind the larger vehicle creating a bottleneck or wait until one of the larger vehicles allows it to pass. In case of an emergency that requires first responders, the street would effectively become unuseful. The street also has very limited visibility as it has a hill and rise in the north direction that has caused vehicle impacts and vehicle crashes into nearby properties with the current amount of traffic that will increase exponentially with 182 units. Pedestrian safety. The absence of sidewalks poses a direct threat to the safety of pedestrians, including children, elderly residents, and those with mobility challenges. It is essential to consider how the influx of residents from the low-income apartment complex will navigate our street without proper walkways. Representatives of the Marion Development Group mentioned that this project is targeted at low income. As such, several of the future residents will rely on public transport. 
The lack of walkability and sidewalks would make this a very dangerous situation for able-bodied pedestrians, not to mention impossible for anyone with disabilities, strollers, shopping caddies. Projects like these should keep, should keep in mind and try to exceed the ADA standards for accessibility if they are truly designed for low-income individuals and families. Last comment received was from Nick Rodina. I'm in strong opposition of this apartment complex that they want to build next to my property at 1204 North 59th Street. In my opinion, this street is too narrow to handle the traffic load. The sidewalk impedes my parking on the east side of my building, which is used every day, and I'm going to be adding a second entrance to my property further to the north at some time in the near future. There needs to be screening and or a wall constructed between my property in the, and the apartments if they happen to keep people and pets out of my construction lot. The trees have already ruined my fence and I am seeking legal counsel to deal with that now that we know who the owners are. We have small equipment that runs and loads unloads material every day on that side of the property and it can be a danger to people and loud at times when we are using our dumpsters and loading dump trucks. All of them are equipped, equipped with the required OSHA backup alarms also. There is a large drainage culvert that runs under my property that originates at my fence line that I've seen no good explanation of how they're going to utilize for the draining of the proposed retention pond or make safe for people or to keep my property from eroding away. I need answers on all of this and some drawings to refer to. This property has been used for this purpose for the last 40 to 50 years, and we are not planning to, to locate. Those are all the comments we've received. Thank you. Is there anyone present who'd like to speak in opposition to the item? Please come and uh, state your name, address. Hi, my name is sorry. Hi, my name is Nick Rodina. I'm the one that uh, sent in the last email. Um, basically, this thing's just going to get rammed down our throats. I mean, you guys already got slick Willie back here to make sure that this all goes fine. And you know, our biggest problem, all of the neighbors, is is everything that, that that's been brought up. It's it's. The lack of space on the street is the fact that everybody that comes down that street is exceeding the speed limit constantly. It's a blind hill. Um, so extensive work needs to be done to keep people, you know. Sir. Yes. For clarity, yes. were you the individual that, that had the reading uh, by the clerk? Yes. That was your comments. I, I apologize. Yes. Uh, you only allowed one opportunity. Okay. 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 But, That's fine. Uh, we, I, I believe that uh, it was thoroughly expressed by the. By okay. The so thank you. Is there anyone like to speak in opposition to this item? Please state your name and address. <clears throat> Zachary Harrison, born and raised, 1425 North 59th Street, right north of that property up there. Uh, as residents of the community, we believe it is cru uh, crucial to address several, several issues related to infrastructure safety, environmental impact, and crime prevention before moving forward with such projects. Our foremost concerns is a potential strain on existing infrastructure, including roads, sewer systems, and utilized utilities on North 59th Street. Uh, it is a narrow rural road without sidewalks measuring only 18 feet wide. This poses a significant challenge, especially during emergencies where the streets limited space and visibility may impede the swift movement of large vehicles and first responders. The absence of sidewalks on North 59th raises serious safety concerns for both pedestrians and drivers. The increased foot traffic coupled with the narrow road creates a hazardous situation. With the current limitations, any additional vehicles would exacerbate the risk of accidents and impact the overall well-being of community members. The lack of sidewalks not only endangers pedestrians, but also poses a significant threat to those with mobility challenges, children and elderly residents. Considering the low income nature of the proposed development, many residents may rely on public transport, making walkability essential for their safety and well being. We recommend exceeding ADA standards for accessibility to ensure the safety for all residents. A comprehensive environmental impact assessment is vital for a project of this scale. We are particularly concerned about the disruption of wildlife habitats, water runoff, and overall ecological sustainability. The eight acre site already houses displaced wildlife and we fear their dispersal. You guys okay? So okay. Just, I didn't know if you guys could hear me while you were talking. I we, just want to make we, sure. We Appreciate you. it. Uh, dispersal to nearby properties. We encourage to we encourage adherence to newer, higher environmental standards compatible with the county's benchmarks. 
The absence of security measures in the proposed complex raises concerns about the potential increase in crime. Security is a shared responsibility that contributes to the overall harm of our community. In the event of emergencies, the lack of security measures could impede swift and orderly evacuations, putting lives at risk. One and a lot minute of the, remaining. In light of these concerns, we strongly urge you to reconsider the proposed project. We recommend a thorough assessment of the issues mentioned above and propose exploring alternative locations, specifically existing vacant lots. This would eliminate the need to clear acres of trees, disrupt wildlife habitats, and ensure proximity to additional amenities and safer walkable streets. We appreciate your attention to these matters and believe that thoughtful consideration or concerns will lead to a more sustainable and harmonious community. Thank you for your time and understanding. Is there anyone present that's likely to speak in opposition? Seeing none, clerk, is uh, there anyone else? Joining us virtually, like speaking opposition. Jean Holland. Mr. Holland, you'll need to unmute. Mr. Holland. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead and state okay. your name and residence, please. Thank you. Jean Holland, 1325 North 59th Street, Kansas City, Kansas. I will start off by saying I did send letters of opposition to all the commissioners and I got responses from a lot of them and one to the city clerk, so I'm not sure why it was not recorded. I'll reference back to the early assisted living position and I, as I make my comments regarding native, neighborhood notification and road conditions. I believe that more of Coronado neighborhood needs to be aware of the development as the corporation states that they are doing this to improve the area shouldn't all in the area be made aware of this. I'm sure the Merriam Corporation and their talking heads have complied with the letter of the law, but announcement on page 24 of the Wyandotte Echo is not a good effort, faith effort for the neighborhood as a whole, and only sending letters to those directly impacted is not addressing the neighborhood as a whole. Did, and I also will ask, did the resident directly north of the project receive a letter? Uh, no one has mentioned them. Um, one question I have is, will neighborhood residents be pack impacted financially for the sewer system? I asked for a comprehensive traffic study, not just traffic count. Issues with speed limit compliance and street maintenance and conditions, especially in inclement weather, should be addressed. Has any consideration been given to or has a school district been contacted on the impact of 180 new families on Lindbergh Elementary School. Finally, I don't believe this is keeping with Plan KCK in providing for diverse income neighborhoods as opposed to locating a high density of, quote, low income, unquote, housing in one area or neighborhood. Nor does, nor does this keep with the plans protecting historic neighborhoods. Uh, one final neighborhood, uh, the gentleman referenced Indian Springs. I will ask why a uh, housing development cannot be uh, perhaps put there. That's the end of my comments. Thank you. Is there anyone else joining us virtually? Sorry. No other hands are raised. Thank you. I'll now close the public hearing. Um, petitioner, closing remarks. Thank you, Mayor Kirk Peterson. Just on two issues that were brought up. One is on public infrastructure, specific and specifically regarding the street and visibility and width. Every developer that comes into uh, this county and the city specifically and proposes a project like this has to. There's a you've seen it. There's pages of items you have to do with stormwater and lighting and just everything. And one of the items you have to look at is traffic and infrastructure. You need to present a professional traffic study, which is then reviewed by the UG's professionals. Uh, public works, et cetera. And there, I will let Mr. Hand speak to it, but there's there's been no issues at all that have been flagged. And, and staff certainly knows how to flag issues. I'm being serious, not saying that as a joke when they think there are problems. Now, the second issue of two mayor was about the sidewalk because I probably counted maybe six times that a sidewalk was brought up. And it's interesting because very early on, staff brought up the idea of making sure we can get pedestrians um, up and down the street, down to State Avenue. We flagged at Planning Commission that we're totally about that. In fact, 
this is the first time that I can think of outside of like a star bond district. I said this at planning commission where a developer has been asked to and is willing to build a sidewalk, many parcels off its site, well beyond next to its property, all the way down to State Avenue. Marion said, no problem. We'd like to do that. But they said, we don't want to have a condition of approval a stipulation that says we have to do it if we don't have the right of it. Does that make sense? Because then you could be stuck. You get a project approved and wait, but I can't build a sidewalk, but I have to. So we've been working with staff over the last, whatever it's been now, two weeks up until today. Um, we've, we've agreed to pay for a survey of the UG's offsite right away to see how wide it is, et cetera. I could go on. I won't belabor it too much. But the point about sidewalks is we're asking to and have a stipulation in this approval tonight to pay for a sidewalk all the way to State Avenue, well beyond our property. We just have to work out the feasibility with right away and things like that. So sidewalks are important. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'll now open questions for our commission. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is more of a clarification question because it goes back to the previous um, application that we we're hearing. So when we are voting tonight, Mr. Hand, are we voting on the plan review and the MPL? Governor Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design, there'll be two votes for this um, case, one for the master plan amendment, one for the preliminary development plan. Unlike the previous development, all preliminary development plans go through the Board of Commissioners. That's your bite at the apple. And then we get it basically to 90% design and the City Planning Commission reviews the final development plan typically with the built-in um, trigger that if the Board of Commissioners wants to see a final development plan, after seeing and hypothetically in that scenario approving a preliminary development plan they can so you do see all of these projects you do get a bite at the apple it's just at a more preliminary level before we go through all the final design work that typically happens up to final development plan okay thank you that so that's the difference between from this one and the last one the last one was the final one which doesn't come to us it goes to planning and then that's it yeah basically after final development plan you go get building permits okay Thank you. That was the clarification I had. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner King. Thank you, Mayor. So the reason I was talking to uh, Commissioner Stites, I was trying to gather information out of the book. And, and I already wrote down pretty much what you had said and what some of the other people said and what the letters, the emails that were received. And I agree that the, the road is very narrow and and most people know my career's in safety. So how's a waste management truck gonna go down that road the same time a fire truck goes down that road or an ambulance? Doesn't sound like the infrastructure's in, in great shape either. And, and a sidewalk's great, but you have to get in and out. And if there's a street that, that's already in trouble, so it's gonna have to be redone widened and there's just something about not being able to get a fire truck down the road or and waste management is going to have to go out down that road you know at least once a week to all those places you know so I, i've got some serious safety concerns about this project thank you commissioner commissioner burroughs well thank you i agree uh i lived to 59th in parallel when I was in high school, I'm quite aware of the condition of that road. I spent many a day on the very site that you all are wanting to build this complex. Spent the night on that property a number of times. I can share with you this spending my cold mornings, standing on the side of that road, waiting for the bus during winter was treacherous, not counting how many times the people came from the south going north and went past the dead end after the new metal arc lane was developed and and had uh, incidents with uh, vehicles i do believe I, if i remember correctly there's two residential developments starting on the north side of parallel going south there's another one just as you crest the hill and they're single family if i remember correctly at least they were when i was a young man and then the rest of the road is no road improvement. 
it's quite overgrown, it's a little rural. And where Red Ranch Rental, that tells you how far back I go, Red Ranch Rental set on that corner, the water that used to drain from that property drained down through Red Ranch Rental. I know because I slept in that culvert many a night as a child. So I'm quite familiar with that area. This is not an area in which we need this type of development around neighborhoods that have been established. But if we're going to ignore sidewalks for the people that have invested in this community with their homes and have lived there for decades, if we're not gonna build sidewalks for them and improve the infrastructure, I question why we're doing it for this project. Next comment. To the east off of 55th, we have a project somewhat like this. I would encourage many of you to visit that and determine if that's what you want in your neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I uh, think as I stated before, I'd watch the um, Planning Commission meetings back in uh, December. I've read and actually have the letters that you all sent me right here and have read them and have responded to you all um, just so that you know that I have received them because I know there are times that people send us things and there's no response at all. Um, and then this morning I actually went by and although I don't think that's an accurate right depiction because it's not every day, I actually went by and, and saw uh, from what I could from the road, the, the property. I'm, let me say that I, I am for affordable housing. And I think, and I know multiple commissioners have said this, maybe we need to have a larger conversation, particularly regarding this interest in my tech uh, 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 in, in tax credits and what that offers, because this will be one of many that will come before us. And we need a strategy as opposed to this piecemeal approach where it's neighborhood by neighborhood, it's very divisive, and um, we end up causing a lot of pain and strife. Um, the road is very, very narrow. Um, and I'm reading through this traffic study and trying to figure out how. Uh, Mr. Peterson, or, or I know that some of the folks from the Meriden Group are here, I'm interested as to how this property qualified for 180 units. That is where I am struggling to put two and two together. Could you just provide like what was the rhyme or reason for this site given the amount of units that we are talking about? If I may, Commissioner, I can answer sure. that question. Um, got her hand, Dr. Planner, resign. You'll notice that this case is not asking for a change of zone. It's already zoned RP5. Okay. So it's looking to only change the master plan amendment underneath it, which is sort of the future look to it. And it's only asking for a preliminary development plan. They're essentially building it as of right. This is what happens when you structurally don't do planning the right way. This area has never had an area plan. It's never had a chance to update its area plan or excuse me, it's land use plan on this category, you're probably looking at a mixed bag of all kinds of former zoning codes and moves from previous eras um, and incorporations, annexations, um, kind of all assembled together. 59th Street is no more than a two inch mill overlay of a dirt road. So I guess I, I, I hear you on that. And so what we are considering tonight and I'm particularly right, the master plan amendment is from medium density residential to high density residential. Yeah. The master plan amendment currently doesn't match the zoning currently. Okay. So, so we're, we're trying, trying to, match to match the master plan to the zoning. Again, if we were to actually do what a good planning practice is and conduct an area plan that would review this, develop a ref, an updated area plan, and then go back and uh, update the zoning map in accordance with that with that land use map update, you probably wouldn't see something like this. I highly doubt we would allow RP5 to still be on that location. But again, that's what it is today. Previous boards of commissioners agreed that that should be zoned RP5. We haven't revisited it probably for decades. I see, I see, I see. 
um, I, I do want to get to the question and maybe someone can answer it. For this particular site, was it just the fact that it's zoned RP5? We have RP5 zoned in multiple places that don't have a two inch uh, overlay, uh, mill overlay for a dirt road. I'm just trying to figure out why this particular location. Commissioner, good question. There's just like any site, any commercial, any residential project we do, there's no there's no one answer. I mean, looked at all available sites up and down the corridor, knew they wanted to be in the sort of State Avenue area, kind of call it center and east. And this is one of a lot of sites and it was available. It was zoning was a was a factor, but it wasn't the only factor. Gotcha. Gotcha. I yeah, I'm I'm just, I mean, I have a list of other questions and things, but the comment from staff really kind of <laughs> has helped me clear this up. I, I, in good conscience, cannot support this. I just, at being there this morning, actually seeing it for myself, um, and and I want to say this, I want us to find a strategy for Litech. I want us to do that. I do believe that what um, the, the medium density, if you all were interested in less units or townhomes or other similar developments in the area, that is, I, I'd, I'd be more than happy to, to, to um, entertain that conversation. I just cannot see if everybody has a car or if half of the people have the car or even two thirds, right? introducing a hundred more vehicles to that area. I just cannot see it working out. Um, but again, this kind of leads itself to the larger problem, which Mr. Han, you have uh, uh, laid out. We need a strategy on multi-unit uh, housing in Wyandotte County. We need one. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. Uh, Mr. Hand could probably address this or either one. Um, did this project come to the EDNF committee for discussion? Or would it ever, you know, if this were to go forward, does this, does this come to EDF? So, Commissioner, because the fixed pilot, just like all our market rate multifamily projects would be proposed, it would, but it has not yet just in terms of sequence, but it's not a surprise. We've been working with appropriate staff on that. It's just a scheduling matter. So not, not yet, but to be really specific, it would be, what are we in for in January? The idea would be trying to in, go in February or March. So at the same time, the final plan would be working through. So those would marry up together. Okay. More or less. So, so just for argument's sake, if this were not to pass this uh, approval of a preliminary plan, um, would it still come to EDF if the developers wanted to look at something else or, or even still this project? No, unfortunately, projects like this take months and months and months and, you know, $100,000 to get all the design and all the things that have to get to this point right now. To go to EDNF with a proposed pilot schedule, you really have to have it in light of a specific project that's been engineered like this. So it'd have to start all totally over again. Well, um, there is a need for the type of uh, housing that you're marketing. I, I kept hearing people talk about low income. The numbers that you cite seem to be more workforce. Um, it's what the federal um, tax credits are called. So it has to, I have to say it accurately, what, what, what it's called, but I understand okay. your point. Uh, so you're calling it was a low income? Well, just the, the tax credit program is called LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, but I, I take your point. I'm explaining why I use that phrase because okay. it'd be confusing and inaccurate if I didn't use it because everybody knows that's okay. the tax credit program's name. And, and I guess my point in that is that shouldn't be really the focus, but it, in my opinion, but the concerns that have been raised about infrastructure and access and, and um, my question about whether we come to EDNF might be another opportunity for those things to be sorted out or talked about. That's why I was asking about the uh, process. But if this does not go through, then it doesn't go to EDNF. I need some help from it. We, we would, I can, I'm, the only reason I know I can answer that, Commissioner, is because obviously for something to go to a committee, there needs to be someone applying or asking. Yeah. And we wouldn't ask because it's just, okay. you wouldn't have your 
it's like apples and oranges. You got to know what fruit you're getting, what site, what the project is. We would never ask that of a, of, a, of the EDNF to look at something okay. that's not set. Like All right, that, that, that made it clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If somebody wanted to be ask me more about the road, as mayor says, I can't just talk affirmatively. I'd be happy to answer questions about the road. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Townsend. Commissioner Davis. Um, I would just say this very, very uh, uh, quickly here. Um, I, again, want to say it over and over again, I want us to figure out and get a handle on how we can use LIHTC for our advantage. I've done some research on the program federally. It is very, very effective in providing probably one of the most effective programs in providing affordable housing throughout the country. I am not anti LIHTC. I am not anti affordable housing. I'm saying 180 units at this particular location just does not make sense to me. And if you all would entertain lessening the amount of units or picking a different a style for the development, I would be more than happy to entertain that. But please uh, uh, hear clearly what I am saying. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. Th th this is weird. You know, uh, I know the area, I used to live off 65th Terrace, but for a couple of different reasons, I'm gonna uh, vote for denial because it doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood Plus, for the safety reasons that I brought up about waste management, fire trucks, ambulance, and bus, school buses going down that road. And that's my motion, Mayor. We're all second. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I accept that, um, and I appreciate you all recognizing my interest in economic development and reinvestment in the disinvested areas of our community. Um, uh, Mr. Talkin, I'm sure he's listening <clears throat> as well as yourself. Uh, just for some clarity. Um, when I say those things, uh, uh, so people will know, and there's no doubt about what I'm talking about. Um, I think Wyandotte County needs more quality housing, amenities, resources, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in these disinvested areas. Um, uh, there are individuals, experts, if you want to call them that, that have told me, and I don't really know if it's true, so I agree with Commissioner Davis, that we need to do um, a little more homework on these types of projects, LIDEC, um, because some of these individuals told me that we have an oversaturation of low-income housing in Wyandotte County, more than enough. Um, but what we're missing out on um, and when you look at the dynamic of 70% of our high wage earners don't live in Wyandotte County, is quality uh, affordable housing at all income levels. And so not so much affordable housing, but housing that is affordable for, for all wage earners. Um, and then putting these quality developments, market rate properties, in these areas that have been disinvested to bring some of these working class people back into these neighborhoods that can contribute um, to help out with our tax base to broaden it um, that would want to shop at restaurants uh, and infuse um, um, those tax resources back into our community be it home purchases or uh, um, some homes in line with uh, what commissioner burroughs mentioned um, just over the years that I've worked here and patrolling the streets for 32 years on the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, I just ask folks to make their own judgment. When you talk about these kind of projects and you look at 27th and Delavan, you look at 29th and Freeman, you look at Graymore, Gateway, Chelsea Plaza, 55th and Freeman, Sunflower, Rosedale Ridge, and I can go on with several other multifamily housing developments that have failed miserably and cause heartburn for the police department, the sheriff's department and our DA um, to uh, keep a handle and a pressure point on the types of uh, calls for service that some of those facilities bring about. I don't know what this would bring, um, but my experience has shown me that sometimes management or the lack thereof um, in these areas uh, cause those conditions. Um, 
but I'm not one to say that we need more affordable housing in Wyandotte County. We need housing that is affordable at all income levels, and we need more market rate housing in these areas that have been disinvested and disenfranchised. Um, and that's just the feedback I'm getting from developers and from residents that actually own their homes in these neighborhoods saying that uh, we've got enough of those type of developments, put some good stuff here and, and bring some quality uh, market rate um, properties um, that can hopefully branch off to uh, actually single homes to where individuals want to live near these types of facilities and anchor their families there and, and pay property taxes, um, which would also, they're going to need restaurants, um, they're going to need other amenities, and they're going to need other things that are not are going to add to our sales tax base. Um, and so I challenge, as we look at these types of properties, we need to be intentional, and I challenge this commission. Um, I think this commission over decades, city council going back decades, uh, probably to the 60s when urban renewal came in, um, Wyandotte County really did a good job of making sure that uh, we took care of those uh, individuals that needed affordable uh, housing and that stock. And that stock is still here um, and that stock is aging and it's growing. And unfortunately, um, those types of developments really haven't uh, generated the type of return on investment um, that would cause the realization of a resurgent um, sustainable and vibrant Wyandotte County. Um, and I look at other communities around us, especially our neighbors to the north, south, and east and west. And um, I think those type of projects can be done, but they have to be done responsibly. Um, and they have to conform to the, to the um, surrounding neighborhoods. And I think that we need to be a little bit more intentional on being community driven to make sure that the neighbors in the neighborhoods um, these are the types of developments they want in their neighbors. Um, so I challenge YDEC um, to uh, look at not just affordable housing, but to look at housing um, that could attract individuals at all income levels. And I personally feel, um, just from the information I'm getting, that we actually need more afford, not affordable, but uh, market rate housing um, that can attract, and we need teachers to live here. Um, we need General Motors workers to live here. Um, we need those individuals that uh, have worked in some of our other areas to live here. And I can tell you, unfortunately, and this is the reality, when you tell people uh, we have a affordable housing project for you, uh, most of those folks are going to say, not just no, but uh, you can imagine they're not going to want to live in those developments. And so we have to really be intentional about our strategies and plannings and make sure that we create um, seamless cities. Um, that uh, that attract those at, at all income levels. So um, I personally would urge this commission to say no to these types of projects moving forward. Um, and let's look at more quality developments um, that are gonna be sustainable for the long-term and they're gonna be market rate to keep working class folks right here. Um, and I have a fear um, of importing additional poverty to Wyandotte County as time goes on in these, in, in, in these types of developments. And again, go take a look at these developments that I named and let those developments speak for yourself and ask yourself if you wanna buy a house near these developments and raise your family in a way uh, for generations to come. I know I wouldn't and others wouldn't either. And so uh, I think that we need to be more intentional about creating quality developments that are gonna anchor people in Wyandotte County. And so um, I believe there was a motion Okay, can you repeat that motion? Yes. Uh, for a couple of different reasons, uh, my motion is for denial. Better food care for the neighborhood, uh, waste management, buses, fire, trucks, and ambulances, an unsafe area. And for those reasons, uh, but my motion is for denial. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? We're all second. It's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing down, clerk, roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Clerk, 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 let me back up one second. There are two votes um, that have to be taken. So for clarity on the vote before we get too far along, um, Commissioner Kane and the second by Commissioner Burroughs, that is a motion uh, for item C2 for this vote uh, for 
plan review application PR 2023-034. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Clerk, can you can you back that up? I can. Roll call. Townsend. Aye. Burns. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Hill. Aye. Kane. Aye. Lopez. Aye. Stites. Aye. Davis. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Burroughs. Aye. Motion carries. All right. The second part of this is for item D1 master plan application NPL 2023-017. Is there a motion for that? Motion for denial for it doesn't fit the, the characteristic of the neighborhood for safety reasons such as waste management, fire trucks, ambulance, and buses driving down an unsafe road. We're all second. There's a motion on a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Dill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That concludes the planning and zoning portion of tonight's meeting. We'll now move to the regular portion of our agenda, which is the regular consent agenda. Um, do any members of the commission, the county administrator, wish to set aside any items on the regular consent agenda? If an item is not set aside, all items on the regular consent agenda will be voted on by one vote. Move to approve all items as submitted. Second. I will accept those motions. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That concludes the portion of our regular meeting and I join us in that capacity. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn us as the board of the Unified Board of Commissions and call us back to order as the Land Bank Board of Trustees. Is there a motion? I so move. There's a motion and a second. Clerk, roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. All right. We are now um, re- um, we're re adjourning as the Land Bank Board of Trustees. And do any members, and we're uh, working on a the Land Bank Board of Trustees consent agenda. I'm sorry. Do any members of the Commissioner Accounting Administrator wish to set, set aside any items on the Land Bank consent agenda? David Smooth to approve. Okay. All right. There are none. I will accept the motions of, uh, to accept the consent agenda as is. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. With no further business on tonight's uh, government before our governing body, thank you all for uh, viewing and for your attendance. Burroughs, motion to adjourn. Davis, second. <laughs> there is a motion. <laughs> a second. <laughs> I'll accept that. <laughs> roll call. Roll call. Townsend? Aye. Burns? Aye. Ramirez? Aye. Hill? Aye. Kane? Aye. Lopez? Aye. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>